Section One of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies, an exhibit of the capital, assets, and losses of the companies, together with a graphic account of the great disaster, accompanied by maps of Chicago showing the burn district. The Insurance Companies and the Chicago Fire Our Fire Insurance System the tremendous losses resulting from the Chicago fire, sustained by the insurance interest of the country, and the prompt settlement of those losses, so far as the companies have been able to meet their liabilities, while they bear testimony to the beneficent mission and great usefulness of this interest, must necessarily lead to greater caution and conservatism in its future management. It is a mere truism to say that the benefits of both fire and life insurance should be more widely distributed, but in order to accomplish this it will be necessary to proceed upon a basis which shall attract capital to the business of insurance, and render it profitable to the insurer as well as the insured. It is useless to expect that capital will flow into this channel from mere considerations of public utility and general benevolence. The men who own or represent capital are noted for their caution, and do not embark their means in extra-hazardous enterprises, unless their profits are commensurate with their risks. Though cheap insurance is certainly a desideratum for the general welfare, there is such a thing as making it too cheap for the safety and advantage of all concerned. This is just what has been done for the last few years during which we have had the maximum of risks with the minimum of rates, and the result has been, as the history and statistics of fire insurance since the war will show, that the business has become unremunerative, and has been gradually transferred from the strong companies, which had nothing to gain and everything to lose, to the weak ones, which had everything to gain and but little to lose while the former have been steadily curtailing their risks and limiting their operations to the best property of their own immediate surroundings the latter through their agents have been scattering their policies broadcast throughout the country without proper discrimination as to the character of their risks many of these expanded companies with small capital and no surplus have been swept away by this great calamity while the solid ones, which refuse to enter into cheap competition with them, for the most part stand firm as a rock. The dear-bought experience of hundreds of ruined policyholders upon this occasion will probably teach them that the cheapest is not always the best, and that our fire insurance system, in order to be efficient, and to practically afford that protection to the community which it professes to guarantee, must be established on a sound and strong foundation. Property holders cannot expect such sure protection unless they are willing to pay a fair price for it, and by encouraging that cheap competition among insurance agents, which is manifestly incompatible with a safe and legitimate business, they only repel and restrict the sphere of those conservative and prudent institutions which alone are trustworthy and capable of performing what they promise in such emergencies as the present. THE DUTY OF THE HOUR Whatever other effects may follow the recent disaster at Chicago, there is one result which must come from this calamity, as matter of vital necessity both for the agents and for the companies they represent. The rates of premium must be advanced at once to a paying point and by means of concerted action on the part of all agents everywhere. We doubt not the agents' recognition of this necessity, nor their disposition to meet it. But action, not theory, is what is wanted, and they should not lose a moment in profiting by the public engrossment with insurance matters, 
to organize themselves in a solid phalanx against a relapse of insurance interests into the old channels of ruinous competition widespread as is this disaster and seriously as it has crippled a number of companies it is a subject of pride that in the great majority of cases losses will be promptly settled and when the facts and figures are finally spread out in authentic form we may expect a reaction in favor of insurance and its promoters such as will astonish even its most ardent friends few companies have failed as regards their policy holders and those which have suffered heavy loss will reorganize at once with less financial capital perhaps but with a reserve of moral capital and honorable prestige which will make their policies worth more than ever before. It is the duty of agents, as men who in prosperous times have reaped the largest share of the harvest, to come promptly to the help of the companies at this juncture, and this they can do by immediately taking steps to make the public realize the value of insurance and the difference between sound and cheap policies. Already in many cities and towns the rates have been advanced to an adequate standard. Rates should be immediately doubled everywhere in the United States. End of Section 1 Of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies Part two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Golden Opportunity Never was there a better opportunity for earnest agents and sound companies to push their fortunes. By striking while the iron is hot, while the ruins still smoke, a live company may accomplish in the next six months more than it could in ten years under ordinary circumstances. Active agents, energetic officers, solvent companies, will now come to the front and carry all before them. The public is alive to the value of insurance policies, which mean indemnity, and will not higgle about rates in the light of the Chicago fire and its crushing testimony against cheap and worthless policies. Now is your chance to enter in and possess the land, gentlemen, officers, and agents. The people are running to meet you more than halfway. They are anxious for once to pay full cost for insurance, if it only be insurance. Let none of you stand back while a few live men rush in and gather a harvest in which you should have a share. Advertise. Circulate your documents. Let your rivalry be only that of getting the best risks at the highest rates, and thus present the insurance companies of the country as a spectacle of bounding elasticity and vitality. Great as have been the losses at Chicago, there is not a company whose assets justify continuance in business, but can turn this seeming disaster into a positive and permanent benefit. The prestige of a company passing through this fiery trial without succumbing will be or should be made equal in moral power to a doubling of its cash capital. See to it that this shall be the result to your own company. A correspondent writing from Hartford discusses as follows the altered condition of fire insurance and fire insurance rates. This disaster will also bring its lesson, for good and unpalatable as it may be, Nevertheless, it will be one not only for the benefit, immediate and direct, of the insurance companies themselves, but also indirectly and eventually of the people at large. It will learn us to put underwriting on a more lasting and enduring foundation, to set aside the petty jealousies and private rivalries which have hitherto existed, much to the detriment of the business, and while there will be, as there must, a general competition, yet it will be based upon system, founded in principle, and tend in no way to lead insurance interests into paths of recklessness and ruin. As a matter of course, this fire will affect the subject of insurance rates, and they will no doubt be advanced. The low-rate system which some of our smaller companies have followed has proved disastrous, and the experiment will not probably be tried again. And this we do not regret. A man is always willing to pay a good price for a good article, 
and if in future policyholders are charged a larger amount for their insurance, they will not be disposed to grumble at the advance if they know that the concern in which they place their risks is pursuing a course which is not experimental and adventurous, but which, on the contrary, is founded in security and safety, and is dictated by all the reasons which human precaution and foresight can invent to guarantee prosperity and success. One of the newspaper reporters, describing the great fire, says, Huge blocks of stone crumbled to dust. The foundations disappeared almost to the bottom stone. The walls were licked up as though of pasteboard, and the huge beams of iron were warped and disappeared like straw. The vaunted fireproof structures offered also as little resistance as the humblest shanty, and went in the common ruin. It may be that this statement requires to be accepted with considerable allowance, but the fact remains, proven incontestably for the first time, that a conflagration may rise to that degree of intensity which will seriously endanger the most massive structures that man is capable of building. Just as the eternal rocks are swept away by fierce volcanic eruptions, yet we should not depreciate the value of the so-called fireproof methods of building. A fireproof building is at worst a barrier to the extension of fire, it checks a conflagration by staying the progress of flame, and if there be only a sufficient number of these barriers, the duration of the fire cannot be long. Who can doubt for a moment that the northern division of Chicago would have been entirely unharmed, if in that ill-fated business district in the south side there had been a hundred fireproof buildings instead of merely two or three. The three great conflagrations of modern history have been the great London fire of 1666, burning of Moscow and burning of Chicago. It is remarkable that the magnitude of these conflagrations was not very far from equal in the number of buildings destroyed. The fire in London consumed 13,200 houses. The Moscow conflagration consumed 11,400 houses. The conflagration in Chicago consumed not far from 15,000 houses. The Chicago conflagration was much more extensive than either of its prototypes, in the extent of territory devastated. The burnt district includes nearly four square miles that of London less than one square mile, that of Moscow considerably more. In the destruction of property also, the Chicago conflagration has taken the first place in history, the loss amounting in round numbers to $150 million. In the rapidity of the conflagration, the Chicago fire is without a parallel. It required 16 days to burn a square mile of London, and several days and nights to burn a somewhat greater area in Moscow. Twenty hours sufficed to consume four square miles of Chicago, a rate of combustion averaging a square mile every five hours. The pluck exhibited by almost all the companies with reference to the Great Fire has been something which falls little short of being sublime. It is not every man who suddenly cut down from wealth to poverty will instantly resume active operations and push forward with even greater energy than before. But here are many companies which have lost money by the million, we might almost say, rising out of the ruins, and as eager for the fray as ever. It would be invidious to mention names, even were it worth while, in illustration of the wonderful elasticity and vital force of the companies in this severe ordeal. The country has reason to rejoice that its underwriters are of the unyielding sort, and that both in spirit and in act they stretch out the helping hand toward Chicago, although it may seem like the dividing up of their last crust. The Hartford Courant says that when New York suffered under the Great Fire of 1835, the Hartford, Aetna, and Protection Fire Insurance Companies were weak in comparison with the great corporations of these days. At the first word they went to the front, and with the personal credit of their directors backing them, paid promptly every dollar. James G. Bowles was secretary of the Hartford in those days. The stock was only partially paid in. The directors pledged their own means for the remainder, 
and sent Mr. Bowles to New York to open an agency near the fire. There he settled the claims as fast as possible, and gave out that he was still ready to insure. All the New York insurance companies but one had failed. Before all the claims had matured, Mr. Bowles had received enough in premiums to pay them. Mr. Bowles was a man to do his duty if it bankrupted him. But it made the fortune of the company. It is within bounds to say that in almost every large town in the country, insurance rates are today not more than half what they should be. In all the cities this is absolutely the fact without qualifications. The volume of average loss makes up the main element in the cost of insurance, and now that the companies are called upon to pay forty or fifty millions on account of Chicago, it is obvious that the cost of insuring has increased by just the ratio thus added to the loss ratio of former years. If the three and a half million dollars paid to Portland justified doubling the rates in 1866, what shall be said now when rates have again touched bottom and the cost of insurance has actually been quadrupled? The simple test will be to add the cost of the Chicago fire to the average cost of insurance for twenty years past, and then tell us what the rates ought to be. And now, from all parts of the country, comes the gratifying intelligence that a universal advance in fire insurance rates has followed the Chicago disaster. The companies which will be able to continue business are none too many, and are none too strong to satisfy the requirements of the business public without this advance in rates. End of Section 2 Three of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies. Part three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great Fire A Comprehensive Account of the Conflagration. It was at nine forty five o'clock on Sunday night, October eighth when the bell sounded the alarm from Box 342, for a fire which proved to be the most disastrous in the world's history. Flames were discovered in a small stable in the rear of a house on the corner of Dickhoven and Jefferson Streets. Hardly had the first alarm sounded when it was followed by another from the same box, and this in turn by a third or general alarm which summoned to that vicinity every available steam engine in the city. The wind was blowing a perfect gale from the south-southwest. With terrible effect the flames leaped around in mad delight and seized upon everything combustible. Shed after shed went down, and dwelling-houses followed in rapid succession. Block after block gave way and family after family were driven from their homes. The fire department were powerless to prevent the spreading of the calamity. At first it was one structure on fire, then another and another were swallowed up in a whirlpool of flames, until finally it was blocks and blocks of buildings which were going down, like grass before the scythe. For upwards of fifteen weeks there had been no heavy rains, and the wooden walls were dry like unto tinder in that portion of the doomed city. In vain the firemen fiercely fought the approach of the conflagration. In vain were fences and small houses hurled to the ground. In vain did the vast crowd rush hither and thither, trying to save the entire west side. Onward stalked the fiery flame and red-hot air, which caused all to flee from before its scorching blasts. With the heat increased the wind, which came howling across the prairie, until at last there arose a perfect hurricane, mighty flakes of fire, hot cinders, black stifling smoke, were driven fiercely at the people, and amid the terrible excitement hundreds of them had their very clothes burned off their backs, as they stood there watching with tearful eyes the going down of so many houses. When the flames had crossed over to Clinton Street, between Ewing and Forquar Streets, there were left probably half a dozen houses, 
which seemed to have been forgotten in the excitement of the moment. But they were not permitted to escape the awful flames. Backward swept the red demon, silently and softly, but swift enough to elude all pursuit, and before the terror-stricken multitude could prevent, all these frame buildings were burned to the ground. The wind continued its roaring fierceness, and house after house was burned. To the left the fire spread forth its heat like the leaves of a fan, until all of the eastern side of Jefferson Street was enveloped in the furnace. To the right it had been driven with great fierceness, and Clinton Street and Canal Street and Beach Street, and then the railroads which run along the western shore of the South Branch were in its grasp. Now was the fire at its fiercest. Upward of twenty blocks were burning. Upward of fifteen hundred buildings, including outhouses, were on fire. Upward of five hundred families were fleeing from the seeming wrath to come. The streets were almost impassable. Carriages and wagons and drays and carts and all sorts of vehicles were brought into requisition and were speedily loaded with household goods. Empty wagons were filled with freight, and where there were no beasts of burden to draw the load, human hands sprang to the rescue and dragged the property toward the north. Then the fire reached over the street, and while that terrible southwestern wind howled onward, it forced its way into the planing mills and the chair factories and all the other shops which skirted the creek in that portion of West Chicago. Then it got into the lumber yards and into the railroad shops, and the roundhouses were soon wrapped in its dead embrace. The bricks themselves seemed only additional fuel. The rolling stock in the railroad yards seemed but a bit of kindling, which helped along a fire already fiercely intense. But worst of all, the elevators were next in danger. For a few moments it seemed as though one or two of the largest would resist the flames and pass through the fire ordeal unscathed. But this thought was not of long duration, for an instant later and the immense piles were in flames from top to bottom. Like the advance of a great army, the fire moved forward in several columns, and like a powerless but unconquered foe, the fire department slowly retreated. But they stubbornly contested every foot of ground, and would not surrender, although often almost entirely surrounded by the dread enemy. Then would they cut their way out, and retreat for a short distance, only to turn again, and hurl their charges of thousands of gallons of water full into the face of the enemy but no power on earth could stem the torrent. Never did firemen fight more fiercely to conquer, and never before did their heroic efforts seem so utterly in vain. Suddenly, away to the north and east, fully five blocks distant, a small flame broke forth and lighted up the already brilliant heavens. The sight sent an awful shudder to the soul of every man, woman, and child who saw it. For a moment every one was spellbound and speechless. Just where it was, the newly discovered fire, was as yet unknown, but it seemed to be in the neighborhood of the South Side Gas Works, and there was no one in all that vast concourse of people but who knew the great danger which was already threatening the other side of the river. Every moment witnessed an increase in the blaze and presently the outlines of the immense reservoir told the story of its immediate vicinity. The fire marshal at once sent every available engine to the south side, and prepared to follow with the remainder immediately. But the flames mounted higher, and the fire grew fiercer, and spread itself out in all directions, until it was impossible to stay its further progress. End of section three. Section four of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies, Part four. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. South Division. As early as twelve o'clock, 
the air of the extreme south division was hot with the fierce breath of the conflagration the gale blew savagely and upon its wings were borne pelting cinders black driving smoke blazing bits of timber and glowing coals these swept thickly over the river drifting upon housetops and drying the wooden buildings along the southern terminus of market franklin adams monroe and madison streets still closer to the combustion point for which they were already too well prepared the housetops were covered with anxious workers and cistern streams tubs and buckets were in constant use to subdue the flying bits of fire that were constantly clinging to shingles and cornices the first foothold obtained by the destroying angel in the south division was in the tar works adjacent to the gas works just south of adams street and nearly opposite the armory almost instantaneously the structure was one livid sheet of flame emitting a dense volume of thick black smoke that curtained this portion of the city as with the pall of doom faster than a man could walk the flames leaped from house to house until fifth avenue wells street was reached a steamer or two was sent thither but their previous experiences were only repeated and no perceptible check was given to the onward progress of the flames from the gas works to the point it had now reached nearly the entire space was filled with small wooden structures and their demolition was the work of but a few minutes the first great danger apprehended from the ignition of the tar was its communication to the gas works and in less than ten minutes the entire establishment was on fire the immense gasometer being completely surrounded by a wall of flame the danger from its explosion drove the crowds away and other scenes of equally absorbing interest occupying their attention when the explosion came it was witnessed by comparatively few people and was it is believed unaccompanied with any fatal results the grand meter was apparently filled to about half its capacity its destruction did not occur until some three hours later apparently but a few minutes subsequent to the ignition of the gas works the wooden buildings south of the armory were found to be on fire forming the apex of another widening track of destruction and very soon joining with the other the two uniting like twin demons of destruction the armory helping to glut their fiendish cravings it may be of interest here to note the peculiarities of the wind currents and their strange effects during all this time as during the entire continuance of the fire the wind was blowing a gale from a southwesterly direction and above the tops of the buildings its course from midnight until four or five o'clock varied but little not veering more than one or two points of the compass to the observer on the street however traversing the main thoroughfares and alleys the wind would seem to come from every direction this is easily explained new centers of intense heat were being continually formed and the sudden rarefication of the air in the different localities and its consequent displacement caused continually artificial currents which swept around the corners and through the alleys in every direction often with the fury of a tornado this will account partly for the rapid widening of the tracks of destruction from their apex to the lake as well as the phenomenon of the fire to use a nautical phrase eating into the wind the Grand Pacific Hotel, upon which the roof had but just been placed, and which, like the stillborn child, was created only for the grave, was among the first of the better class of structures assaulted by the fire. Angered at its imposing front, and scorning the implied durability of its superb dimensions, the flames stormed relentlessly in, above, and around it, until, assured that it was at their absolute mercy, they left it tottering to the earth and crawled luridly along the street in search of further prey it was now that the waves of fire began to take upon themselves the mightiest of proportions how it was that while even a hundred buildings might be blazing others far in advance of the track of the storm could not be protected 
has not been understood by those who were not despairingly following the course of the destruction it was partly on account of the artificial currents already mentioned and because the huge tongues of flame actually stretched themselves out upon the pinions of the wind for acres sheets of fire would reach over entire blocks wrapping in every building enclosed by the four streets bounding them and scarcely allowing the dwellers in the houses time to dash away unscorched hardly twenty minutes had elapsed from the burning of the pacific hotel before the fire had cut its hot swath through every one of the magnificent buildings intervening upon la salle street and had fallen mercilessly upon the chamber of commerce the few heroic workers of the police and fire departments who had not already dropped out of the ranks of fighters from sheer exhaustion sought to once more check the progress of devastation by the aid of powder a number of kegs were thrown into the basement of the grand business palace of the merchants insurance company a slow match was applied and as the crowd drew back the explosion ensued a broad black chasm was opened in the face of the street but with as little attention to the space intervening as though it had only been across an ordinary alley the arms of flame swung over the gap and tore lustily at the rows of banking houses and insurance structures beyond the courthouse was now faced with a swaying front of fire on the south and west sides but as the building was in the centre of an open square and solidly constructed it was taken as a matter of course that it would be able to survive if nothing else should be left standing around it talk about the courthouse said a leading banker among the spectators whose own establishment had already been melted to the very foundations it will show to be about the only sound building on the south side to-morrow and yet in another five minutes a great burning timber wrenched from the tumbling ruins of a la salle street edifice had been hurled in wild fury at the wooden dome of the courthouse as if a thousand slaves of the fire king had hidden within the fatal structure awaiting this signal the flames seemed to leap to simultaneous life in every part of the building and soon the hot scorched walls alone remained the course of the fire was now directed almost due east for a few minutes and hooley's opera house the republican office and the whole of washington street to dearborn was consumed crosby's opera house came next in order renovations to the extent of eighty thousand dollars had just been instituted in this edifice and the place was to have been rededicated that same night by the thomas orchestra the combustible nature of the building caused it to burn with astonishing rapidity and soon its walls surged in carrying with them among other treasures the contents of three mammoth piano houses and a number of art treasures including paintings by some of the leading masters of the old and new worlds the st james hotel was next fired and here at the corner of state and madison streets the two savage currents of fire that had parted company near the chamber of commerce joined hideous issue once more the course of one of these currents has been indicated the other had swept down franklin wells and la salle streets to the main banks of the river swallowing elevators banks trade palaces the briggs sherman tremont and other large hotels woods museum the beautiful structures of lake and randolph streets and the entire surface comprised between market south water washington and state streets many lives were known to have been lost up to this time but in the infernal furnace into which chicago had been turned it was impossible to conjecture or dare to imagine how many the heat more intense than anything that had ever been described in the annals of broad spread conflagrations of the past had fairly crumbled to hot dust and ashes the heaviest of building stone of what chance was there then of ever finding the remains of lost humanity by those who were already inquiring with mad anxiety for the missing ones but all thoughts of others soon began to vanish in fears for the safety of the living 
the stoutest of masonry and the thickest of iron had disappeared like wax before the blast field and lighter's magnificent store second only in size and value of contents to one dry goods house in the land was already in flames the streets were now crammed with vehicles conveying away valuables and the sidewalks were running over with jostling men and women all in a dazed wild strife for the salvation of self friends and property the thieving horror had not yet broken out and up to this time there had been a common noble striving to aid the sufferers and stay the march of the furious flames crackling and howling demoniacally at the ruin and misery left behind eager for more valuable prey the flames sped on taking in their course the track continually widening from the causes mentioned above farwell hall and the elegant stone structures surrounding it and all the newspaper offices except that of the tribune leaving nothing behind but the grandest ruins the world ever saw the block bounded by dearborn washington state and madison streets was some little time in burning indeed after the corner occupied by the union trust and savings institution had burned it was believed that the large vacant lot created a short time before by the tearing down of the old dearborn school would save mayo's corner and the st denis hotel but the fire in spite of the terrible strength of the wind in the other direction eventually contrived to beat up against the gale and by devouring the stores of gossage and others on the west side of state and the book houses of griggs keen and cook and the western news company on the east side to blister the st denis to the igniting point and then mcvicker's theatre and the tribune building formed the northern boundary of the south division it was here that the few workers now left with courage enough to contest with miserable fortune made their final stand the tribune building was believed to be fireproof if any structure devised by man could be proof against such a combination of the elements as was now raging the post office had yielded to the assault and was only a smouldering ruin and from away down to the devastated depot of the illinois central the flames had pushed back until they interlocked once more at the custom house with the fire that had torn its way from the michigan central depot surrounded by the enemy on every quarter and having held proudly up against the attack till long after daybreak there was the same sad capitulations enacted here that had been the story of the entire night mick vickers yielded first and was instantly a heap of brick and ashes and the tribune structure was not long in following the walls of this latter structure with those of the custom house first national bank and courthouse proving the most stubborn evidences of the worth of the architect's skill remaining in chicago up to this time the elegant and costly row of buildings on dearborn street north of the post office had escaped they included the two honore structures the bigelow house which was soon to have been opened and the de haven block the latter extending from quincy to jackson street the two blocks bounded by monroe state jackson and dearborn streets that resting on jackson street including the palmer house and the academy of design were also intact a new line of flame however had been formed some distance to the southward of the armory and west of the michigan southern depot and was sweeping on in its mad resistless career and it was felt that the above-mentioned property was in the greatest peril the depot a noble stone structure upon which great reliance was placed for the safety of the adjacent property to the eastward made but a feeble resistance and soon with a large number of passenger cars inside was in ruins the large row of wooden tenements on griswold street fronting the depot on the east succumbed at once presenting a wall of fire of the length of the depot it burned rapidly through to third avenue but at that point the wind which had begun to show a changeableness it had not previously exhibited veered to a point considerably east of south in which quarter it remained for some time 
Encouraged by this, a desperate fight was made on Third Avenue, and for some minutes, minutes that seemed hours in the torturing alternations of hope and fear, the fiery monster was held at bay. The stone yards on La Salle Street also temporarily checked the progress of the fire south. Thousands of people, occupying the large tract from Third Avenue and Dearborn Street to the lake, watched, with anxious countenances and bated breath, the result of the battle that was to decide the fate of their homes. The wind benignly continued to blow from the same quarter, and the hopes that had been raised, slight at first, grew stronger. It was an awful crisis. At no period in the history of that terrible day were more momentous interests trembling in the balance. The occupants of the Michigan Avenue palaces and the humble cottagers were there side by side, breathing supplications and agonizing prayers that their hearthstones might be spared. The Christian Brothers School, at the corner of Van Buren Street and Third Avenue, a massive brick structure, was soon ignited, but its walls proved sound and strong, and the interior was almost entirely burned before they fell. New hopes were born of this, but only to be succeeded by the blankest despair, and the suspense was not for long. Making a clean skip over the Dehaven block, a shower of firebrands, hurled thither by a treacherous gust of wind, alighted on the roof of the Bigelow house, and that magnificent building was soon a seething furnace of flame, quickly followed by the two Honoré buildings. The one nearest the Bigelow Hotel was unfinished, but was rapidly approaching completion, and as a model of architectural beauty was hardly rivaled in the city. From these buildings, as if maddened at their slight detention, the flames spread to the standing buildings west and southwest with redoubled fury, enwrapping the block containing the Palmer House and Academy of Design, and that directly north in an inconceivably short time. The Palmer House was the tallest building in the city, eight stories high, three of which were in its mansard roof and the scene of its demolition, which was more rapid than the account can be transmitted to paper, was inexpressibly grand. The march of the devouring element from this point to the lake was uninterrupted. The intervening buildings, including many of the finest private residences in the city, melting away like the dry stubble of the prairie. For some time after the ignition of the Bigelow House, the De Haven block stood unscathed, but at last it too was forced to yield to the inevitable. It was a long three-story building, the opposite side of Dearborn Street, being occupied by a row of small wooden tenements. A stream was brought to bear upon these, and in the blistering heat three firemen, heroes every one, fully conscious of the tremendous interests committed to them, stood manfully at their posts. They did their work nobly and successfully. The De Haven block was leveled to the ground, and the whole row of wooden buildings had been perfectly protected. From a thousand parched throats the thankful ejaculation went up, We are saved! Delusive hope! One danger was averted, only to be succeeded by others beyond the power of man to avert. The wind again suddenly turned to the southwest, carrying with it a baptism of fire, which made it apparent that the whole remaining portion of the city north of Harrison Street was doomed. Churches, palatial residences, everything was swept by the besom of destruction, an irresistible avalanche of flame. In concert with the work of devastation just described, from the track of flame several blocks below, which had long before cut its way to the lake, as if executing a well-devised military maneuver. The fire had been steadily eating its way against the wind, the point of junction being at or near Adams Street. From this it was evident that even with the wind blowing a gale from the south, the entire south division was in danger. The supply of water had long before failed except from the basin. 
a more heroic treatment alone could save what remained of the city it was at once and unhesitatingly determined upon and then commenced the first systematic and thorough use of gunpowder as the only means of preventing the continuance of the work of ruin it was conducted under the personal supervision of general sheridan building after building was demolished the reports of the successive explosions coming at intervals of a very few moments and being plainly audible above the continuous din each discharge announcing that at last the battle was being fought and won the great fire which was to render chicago forever memorable in the annals of history was ended in the south division the last building to burn was terrace row a palatial block of private residences on michigan avenue extending northward from harrison street its destruction required two or three hours as nothing remained in its rear to accelerate the work about eighteen hours from the first discovery of the fire on de Coven street the last wall of terrace row fell in the south division north of a diagonal line reaching from the east end of harrison street to polk street bridge there remained two buildings unharmed one the large business block immediately north of randolph street bridge and the other an unfinished stone structure at the corner of monroe and la salle streets the entire business portion of the city was obliterated two-thirds of the territorial area of the city was unscathed but chicago as a great business mart the proud commercial center of the growing west was no more was ever devastation more complete immense as is the burnt area in the south division for a single fortunate circumstance it might and probably would have been doubled immediately south of the michigan southern passenger depot was a long fireproof warehouse on the side fronting the fire there were but two windows which afforded the only possible opportunity for the fire fiend to effect a lodgment these were successfully guarded by a small corps of men with pails the building was saved and with it undoubtedly the entire tract north of twelfth street End of section four. Five of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies. Part five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. North Division. The North Side, in proportion to its size, perhaps suffered more than both of the other divisions united. Practically, with the exception of a few streets which were occupied by retail stores to a certain extent, as Clark and Wells Streets, and also North Water and Kinsey Streets, which were occupied by wholesale stores, commission merchants, wholesale butchers, manufactories, etc., and a narrow strip along the north branch occupied by lumber and coal yards, the north side was almost exclusively a residence portion of the city. In the extent of territory burned, North Chicago was also the most unfortunate. Doubly unfortunate also was it in the fact that when the fire once started north of the river, its progress was entirely unchecked, all the fire engines being at work on the south side, from whence they could not reach the north side, even if they would except by a long detour around by Twelfth Street and the West Division, a raging barrier of flame making it impossible for the engines to pass over either the Lake Street, Randolph Street, Madison Street, or Adams Street bridges to the west side, and so from that side over the Kinsey Street bridge and other bridges north of that bridge. In addition to this, the north side was unfortunate, and that its population, moving almost block by block as the flames progressed north, were at last compelled, with the exception of a comparatively few families, to sleep out all night on the open prairie, which environs the North Division on the west and north, the fire not ceasing its march of desolation 
until it had devoured all but a narrow strip of houses on the west side of that portion of the North Division, which lies north of Division Street. The commencement of the fire on the north side seems to have been at the Galena Elevator, which is located on the north side of the main branch between State Street and Rush Street, the time when it first crossed over being about twenty minutes to six o'clock in the morning. Having once got a start to the north of the river, the fire rapidly progressed north, east, and west, the back fire west being unusually rapid. The corner of Rush and Illinois streets, three blocks beyond the elevator, where Judge Grant Goodrich resided, was soon reached. Business portion burned. The fire then, as above intimated, progressed rapidly west, as well as north and east, first burning down the old lake house, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, brick hotel in Chicago. In its course west, it also burned down, in addition to the other buildings, Old St. James's Church, the oldest brick church in Chicago, which was occupied as a storehouse. About this time, other portions of the north side adjoining the river caught fire, and soon all North Water Street, which was occupied by wholesale stores and large wholesale markets, was in flames the Galena Depot, the Hoff House on Wells Street, and the Wheeler Elevator west of Wells Street being also burned down. The north side bridges also were rapidly burned up, the flames from them helping to communicate the fire rapidly all along the north shore of the main branch. Not a bridge connecting the north side with the south side was left. Wells Street Bridge, Clark Street Bridge, State Street Bridge, Rush Street Bridge, all were burned. Between Kinsey Street and the river, all was laid low and buried in a mass of undistinguishable ruins. Ulrich's Hall, the Ewing Block, the Galena Depot, the offices of the Northwestern Company, at the corner of Wells and Kinsey Streets, the Galena Elevator, all were burned down in a miraculously short space of time. Between Kinsey Street and Illinois Street, from the north branch to the lake, nearly all was burned, among the prominent buildings consumed being the Revere House on the northeast corner of Kinsey and Clark, the North Market Hall, one of the oldest buildings in Chicago, the Lake House, one of the oldest brick structures in the city, the Mammoth Reaper Factory of McCormick and Company, a large sugar refinery, and an extensive coal yard the last three establishments being located east of Rush Street. A few fortunate buildings were left standing, but they only seemed to emphasize the ruins around them. These exceptions were about a block of buildings extending west from Market Street to the North Branch, on the north side of Kinsey Street, and a large brick building occupied as a stove warehouse by Rathbone and Company, located to the south of Ogden Slip, on the land which has been made between it and the slip, and which extends out into the lake several hundred feet. Between Illinois Street and Chicago Avenue, the fire progressed with irrepressible fury and rapidity, soon enveloping the whole section, including in it both the most beautiful and the most forbidding portions of the North Division. On the west of Clark Street and south of Chicago Avenue was a section of the city densely populated, filled with buildings occupied many of them by two and three families, a region which in years gone by was noted for the disorderly character of its elections. Its only prominent features were a few churches, including the German Lutheran Church on the corner of La Salle and Ohio Streets and a Norwegian Lutheran church built in 1855 on the corner of Superior and Franklin Streets. The Kinsey School, a four-story brick building on Ohio Street, between LaSalle and Wells. The fine large structure known as the German House, dedicated last year, and containing one of the finest and best proportioned halls in the city. This portion of the city had, in fact, just begun to renovate itself, its streets were being raised and graded, and new buildings erected. East of Clark Street to the lake, between Illinois Street and Chicago Avenue, 
was the pride of the North Division. Its streets were bordered with rows of magnificent trees, beautiful gardens, elegant mansions, noble churches, all of which fell before the destroyer. Among the churches were the North Presbyterian Church, an immense brick structure on the corner of Indiana and Cass Streets, a couple of frame churches on Dearborn Street, the new St. James Church, a beautiful Gothic stone structure on the corner of Huron and Cass Streets, and the vast structure of the Cathedral of the Holy Name on the corner of State and Superior Streets. Among the other prominent public buildings were the Catholic College of St. Mary of the Lake, occupying the whole block north of the Cathedral of the Holy Name, the Orphan's Home, conducted by the Sisters of Mercy, the Historical Society's building on Ontario Street, east of Clark, in which were kept, among many other valuable historical records, the original proclamation of emancipation by President Lincoln, and the North Side Police Station on Huron Street, between Clark and Dearborn Streets, a substantial and well-arranged building. Among the prominent residences were those of Mrs. Walter L. Newberry, whose grounds occupied the whole block bounded by Ontario, Rush, Pine, and Erie streets, that of Isaac N. Arnold, occupying the block north, that of McGee, occupying the block southwest of the Ogden block, etc. In short, this section of the North Division was full of beautiful residences and gardens. In the northeast corner of this section was the vast building of Lill's Ale and Lager Beer Brewery, occupying the two blocks bounded on the south by Superior Street, on the north by Chicago Avenue, on the west by Pine Street, and on the east by the Lake, the whole of the two blocks being occupied by the brewery, except a small slip on the southwest corner of Pine and Superior Streets, and a small portion occupied by the residence of Mr. Lill. In the western of the two blocks were the ice house, the malt house, the brewing house, etc., all substantial and elegant brick buildings. The eastern block, or rather block and a half, were occupied by stables, carpenter shop, cooper shop, blacksmith shop, etc., several of which were built out over the lake on piles. The Chicago Water Works before tracing the progress of the fire further northward, must be mentioned the burning of the waterworks, and the curious, or rather incomprehensible, manner in which it caught fire, almost two hours before the time that the fire first reached the North Division across the main branch. As stated above, the Galena elevator at the edge of the main branch caught fire from the south side at about twenty minutes to six o'clock. At about twenty minutes before four o'clock, fire was discovered in the carpenter shop of Mr. Lill, built on piles above the shallow water of the lake. The employees at the brewery immediately endeavored to extinguish the flames, but it was found impossible, and all the efforts of the men were confined to prevent their extension. Standing between the burning carpenter shop and the waterworks, extending northwest of the shop, stood one of Mr. Lill's bookkeepers. Turning round toward the waterworks, he exclaimed, My God, the waterworks are in flames! This gentleman states positively that the flames from the waterworks, when he first saw them, were issuing from the western portion of the pumping works, no flames being seen from the eastern portion of the grounds, which were occupied with coal sheds, etc. On the other hand, the employees at the waterworks say that the fire commenced about half-past three o'clock in the morning, that it commenced in the eastern part of the waterworks, and that it took fire from the shed. Another gentleman testifies that the carpenter shop, or the cooper shop as he called it, was burned down before the fire commenced in the waterworks, and that when the waterworks were in full flame, the main body of Lill's brewery, with the exception of the carpenter shop, was intact. The time of the commencement of the fire in Lill's carpenter shop and the waterworks, however, differs one hour, the last-named witness asserting that the waterworks commenced burning at about half-past two or three o'clock. The whole building was soon in flames, 
and in a few minutes the engineers had to rush out of the building to save their lives. The machinery was very considerably injured. The water tower, however, to the west of the pumping works, was almost entirely uninjured. ON THE SANDS Before relating the further progress of the flames northward, must also be noticed the mingled scenes of sorrow and laughter, or tragedy and comedy, which were presented on what were once known as the sands, that part of the lake shore which lies east of that portion of the north side which has been described above. This sandy waste varies in width between one and two blocks, being the widest at the southern end near the river, where a frame building stood here and there before the fire. As soon as the fire broke out along the north side of the main river, and the rapidity of its progress showed that it would sweep the north side or a considerable portion of it, all the inhabitants of the district described lying east of State Street, both rich and poor, both the tenants of the shanties and the cottages which occupied North Water Street, Michigan Street, Illinois Street, and the south end of St. Clair Street, and the tenants of the aristocratic mansions north of this locality, fled to the lake shore, carrying with them whatever they were able to carry in their hands, but little and but short opportunity being afforded to do more. The scene was one of indescribable confusion, of horror and dismay, intermingled to the mere spectator with laughable incidents, which were, however, quickly drowned in the overwhelming horror which surrounded them all. Where the lake shore or sands, were narrow, and the burning buildings approached close to the lake shore, despair reigned. The water was the apparent boundary of the place of refuge. The intense heat from the burning buildings, even the flames from them, reached the water, and even stretched out over it, and the flying men, women, and children rushed into the lake, till nothing but their heads appeared above the surface of the waters. But the fiery fiend was not satisfied. The hair was burned off the heads of many, while some never came out of the water alive. Many who stayed on the shore, where the space between the fire and water was a little wider, had the clothes burned from off their backs. Those again who lived west of Clark Street in the district named, as soon as they saw that they must succumb to the advancing flames, after flying and moving north their goods from block to block, rushed across the bridges, which, with one exception, that of the Chicago Avenue Bridge, remained standing. There was a grand emigration to the west side of people and goods, of little children and big, of crying women and excited men, of broken furniture and cracked crockery, of wheelbarrows, buggies, one-horse teams, two-horse teams, heavy wagons and light wagons, everything that could be saved. What was saved in the district south of Chicago Avenue, except what has been already mentioned, was located on the banks of the river. The property saved from the flames was as follows. The new north side gas works just south of the Chicago Avenue Bridge, the old works south of that being burned, a little lumber yard just south of Erie Street, which was partially built on piles into the river, several coal yards along Kingsbury Street, which runs along the riverside at a distance of about half a block. The coal yard of Blake, Whitehouse & Company was saved almost entire, a large cheap frame building in which coal was piled up being alone destroyed. Next north of this was Reno and Little's coal yard. Here most of the coal was saved, though nothing was left of several large piles but the cinders. Several small frame buildings on Kingsbury Street between Indiana and Kinsey Streets are only partially burned and can be repaired. Holbrook's and Dewey and Company's coal yards to the east of Kingsbury Street and Brown and Van Arsdale's Manufacturing Company's building were also left uninjured to any serious extent. North of Chicago Avenue At this time, between five and half-past five, the line of the fire as it progressed north was about a mile in width. 
along the entire line the fire appeared as if attempting to see which portion could surpass the other in its march of destruction to the east near the lake shore were the large ale and larger beer breweries of sands huck brandt bowman schmidt bush doyle etc to the west near the north branch was a densely inhabited district filled with wooden houses as dry as tinder from the three four and five stories height of the one the sparks and burning charcoal from the wooded cupolas of the breweries were blown blocks northward setting fire to the buildings on which they fell on the west the closely built wooden frame buildings having no brick walls to temporarily stay their progress seemed to surrender instantaneously to the raging fire fiend that did not crawl but seemed to rush upon them with unrestrainable fury all seemed to be immersed in a hell of flame no attempts were made to stem the progress of the fire all that the tenants of the houses could do was to save a few of their household goods and this too at the risk of their lives the scene was rendered still more appalling by the fact that during the earlier stages of the fire thousands of the able-bodied men had rushed to the south side to witness the fire there not then dreaming that it would reach their own homes before the fire on the south side these fathers brothers and sons were gradually driven across the river until the rapidity of the progress of the flames convinced them that their own families were in danger being at last convinced they rushed in frantic haste to save what little they could but they arrived at their homes most of them in an exhausted condition they did their best but the best was but little all that many could do was to aid in saving the lives of their wives and children with their all standing in their houses many attempted impossible things and rushed into burning buildings never to come out alive for the wind rushed on in horrible fury and seemed to envelop three or four houses at once in one fell swoop until the densely populated district to the west of la salle street and between chicago avenue and north avenue had been wasted there was no stay to the rapid progress of the fire all that many people could do was to save themselves and perhaps a few valuables that they could carry in their hands a few indeed of those who saw beforehand that their homes would be burned down even when the flames were half a mile off saved perhaps half of their furniture but many of these even were able to save but little no conveyance could be found in many cases and piles of furniture were only saved from the house to be burned in the street east of dearborn street the scene was a parallel one the homeless occupants of the houses in many cases rushing to the narrow beach which bounds this portion of the north division on the east and the same sufferings that occurred on the portion of the beach referred to south of this were repeated and aggravated by the narrowness of the beach how many were killed how many dangerously burned it will be impossible to find out relatives and friends have not waited for the coroner but have buried their own dead on their own responsibility and no one person will ever know the names or even the number of the victims of the fire in the north division in the district mentioned with the exception of la salle street clark street and dearborn street the population was densely packed in many of the houses lived two or three families to the east of it were large breweries where till the last moment the employees worked to save the buildings at last rushing to their own already burning buildings to save their families children as is usual in poor districts seemed to swarm around every building and how many of these left to their own care infants toddling children little boys and girls sank before the fire it is impossible to estimate suffice it to say that hundreds have been missed who were seen at the fire but never since a fortunate district that portion of the north division which lies between chestnut street and oak street and between la salle street and dearborn street was remarkably fortunate 
the only house in the north division inside the limits of the fire that has escaped not only destruction but even injury is located in this district this house is that of mallon d ogden esq on the north side of the street variously known as whiting and whitney streets and lafayette place undoubtedly the saving of this house from the flames was due to the fact that south of it was the washington park or square and on the southwest and west the two blocks occupied the southern by a mr mccagg and the northern by the widow of a rich citizen on each of the last two named blocks only one house stood the house on the latter block was almost entirely destroyed the house on the block to the south was but partially destroyed and the large hothouse to the south of it and one of the finest in the city was hardly injured at all but a few panes of glass on the north side of it being broken by the heat among other buildings burned was the ogden school near state street lincoln park and old city cemetery these deserve special mention lincoln park the glory of the north division has been almost entirely preserved but few trees have been injured except in the southeastern portion of the park where the dead house stood and where a few trees are burned the smallpox hospital to the east on the lake shore being also destroyed the gravestones or rather board memorials of the dead poor are many of them destroyed and their relatives will know no more the place of rest of their kindred the fences around the graves the boards which have told to the wanderer their names are all destroyed in the southern portion of the old cemetery in the park itself many took refuge though the great majority as hereafter stated fled to the prairies on the northwest north of north avenue no efforts whatever were made to stop the progress of the flames with one exception which will be hereafter mentioned they followed out their course the only means that prevented their progress both north and west being stretches of bare prairie on which there was nothing to burn excepting on clark and wells streets the houses were more or less separated from each other occupying or being separated from each other by two or three lots and often more a small portion of the district north of north avenue and west of wells street was thickly settled the northern limit of the fire at fullerton avenue a little over two and a half miles north of the river the progress of the fire was finally stopped a lull of the wind between two and four o'clock on tuesday morning aided in the work of preventing the further progress of the flames northward the only houses burned north of fullerton avenue being mr john huck's residence and a building occupied by a mr felk between the hours named mr huck's men turned out and beat out the sparks that came from the south as they fell on the ground a slight rain falling at the same time aided in the work a night on the prairie during all this time however that the fire had been raging in the north division sometimes advancing directly northeast sometimes progressing westward with a terrible backfire people had been flying north and northwest until the few houses within reach in lakeview and beyond the limits were crowded full of refugees and the flying population were compelled to take refuge on the open prairie here were gathered thousands of people tired men delicate women children in arms without cover without shelter of any kind many indeed without clothes on their backs worse than all here too were compelled to rest from their long continued flight the sick and the wounded and as if these experiences were not enough to satisfy the demon of destruction that had driven them hither women were seized with the pains of childbirth and children were born on the open prairie the scene was a sorrowful one even water was denied to the parched lips of the unexpected wanderers upon the prairies boundaries of the fire on the north side the boundaries of the fire in the north division were as follows with the exception of the few buildings mentioned above, 
the fire extended over all the north division from the main branch to division street and from the north branch to the lake very nearly seven hundred acres of territory the fire left the north branch at division street where it left a few houses standing along the side of the river the back fire then extended to the river again or to what is known as the north branch canal which connects the ends of a semicircle in the river which bends over to the west following the canal or new channel of the river for a short distance the fire then tended a little to the east as far as halstead street up which it extended to clyburn avenue the back fire extending along the avenue northwest to blackhawk street and a little west until it reached orchard street a north and south street excepting at its junction with the avenue where it runs for about a block in a northeast direction after reaching orchard street the fire proceeded north to willard street where it proceeded east along howe street to hurlbut street across a couple of undivided blocks along hurlbut street the fire proceeded north to center avenue on which only three houses were burned down the blocks around being nearly vacant it then advanced up hurlbut street to within about one hundred feet of fullerton avenue in the meanwhile the fire had taken all east of this with the exception of lincoln park north of fullerton avenue the fire burned up only two houses those being located east of clark street here the progress of the fire was stayed in the manner stated above End of section 5of the great chicago fire by various authors the chicago fire and the fire insurance companies part six this librivox recording is in the public domain between fire and water no narrative could possess more terrible interest than that which should tell in the simplest words the story of the many wonderful escapes from death in the awful conflagration of chicago that many persons perished in the burning is already known. That the number may have been hundreds is possible. God alone can ever know the manner or the agonies of their death. But of thousands of those who escaped from the awful cyclone of fire, the story is one that finds hardly a parallel in all human experience since the world began. The greater number of these terrible experiences occurred in the North Division, the more combustible nature of the buildings in that part of the city gave to the conflagration a wider sweep and a more rapid movement than in the south division like a mighty line of battle the conflagration extended its terrible banners of flame until the right rested on the lake the left on the river then advancing in one awful charge it literally swept that portion of the city from the face of the earth nothing could penetrate that vast line of flame and live before it sixty thousand men women and children fled for their lives on the eastern side of the district many persons fled to the lake shore supposing that to be a place of entire safety many indeed were cut off by the rapidly advancing flames from the possibility of escape in any other direction for nearly all who sought escape in that direction the sequel proved that they had taken a fearful chance the experience of mr lambert tree and family was in part that of many perceiving that his own house could not escape mr tree with his wife and child and aged father went to the residence of his father-in-law mr mcgee the mcgee residence occupied the centre of a large enclosure and was therefore regarded as a place of probable safety but the very fact that of its isolation from surrounding buildings soon revealed that it was the most dangerous retreat that could have been chosen the conflagration enveloped it completely on all sides before the house took fire on the side opposite to the approaching flames the square was enclosed by a high board fence without openings on the front the flames had already cut off all possibility of retreat the only way of escape was toward the northeast over the fence already mentioned 
a barrier which three aged persons a woman already fainting in the dense smoke and a little child half suffocated could not possibly scale the fence too was on fire the house was already enveloped in a shower of burning firebrands a horrible death seemed to be the inevitable doom of the entire party at this terrible juncture a portion of the burning fence fell to the ground opening a gateway from the fiery cul-de-sac through this opening mr tree dragging his fainting wife and child fled toward the lake in the flight from the premises the party became separated nothing more was seen of mr and mrs mcgee until on the following day they were found on the prairie northwest of the city in their flight they had taken a different direction from the others and had no choice but to hasten on before the advancing fire until beyond the line of its horrible path the aged couple passed the night of monday on the open prairie in an open space sheltered by the walls of lill's brewery mr tree and his family with some of their neighbors again supposed themselves to be in a place of safety but from this refuge they were also driven by the advancing flames the intense heat drove them to the beach and even into the water in which many men women and children stood for an hour throwing water over their clothing to prevent it taking fire from the flame and sparks which a fierce wind drove toward them in one instance the dress of a lady actually took fire the wearer with great presence of mind removed it from her person to the lake the heat ever and anon enveloped the fugitives like hot blasts from the mouth of a furnace dense clouds of stifling smoke swept over them threatening instant suffocation children fainted and strong men could only breathe by keeping their faces to the ground until some new air current lifting the smoke or turning aside the fiery blast gave temporary relief the situation is described by those who experienced its horrors as one surpassing all possibilities of conception or belief but the flames finding at length no more to consume swept on and the fugitives were saved loss and insurance it is impossible to ascertain in dollars and cents the precise amount of the loss it is not however impossible to make a trustworthy approximation from actual and unimpeachable data and preliminary thereto it may be well to say that the ten thousand guesses at the aggregate loss which one hears in every place are mostly of the wildest and absurd character the aggregate loss has been variously guessed to be two three four five and so on to eight or nine hundred millions of dollars one will meet in an hour's walk among the ruins twenty intelligent men who will avow that not a dollar less than five hundred million dollars of property has been destroyed this is nonsense at the most liberal estimate five hundred million dollars would cover the value of every particle of property of every kind that ever existed within the corporate limits of chicago it is certainly not all destroyed nor a half nor a third of it a careful calculation will show that a hundred and fifty million dollars is a liberal estimate for the value that has been destroyed by the conflagration the valuation of property for city taxation for the present year was in round numbers as follows real estate including buildings south division a hundred and ten million dollars west division eighty seven million dollars north division thirty eight million dollars total two hundred and thirty five million dollars personal property south division forty million dollars west division eight million dollars north division five million dollars total fifty three million dollars the judgment of the most trustworthy experts is that the assessed valuation of real property is rather over than under two-thirds of actual cash value upon an average of the whole city while that of personal property is probably rather under than over one-third of the actual cash value adding one-third to the real property and two-thirds to the personal and the total value of all the property in the city of chicago before the fire was four hundred and sixty nine million dollars 
how much of this value still remains how much of it has the fire destroyed assessment district number one included all the south division north of twelfth street the total valuation of land and buildings in that district was sixty four million dollars about forty million dollars for the former and twenty four million for the latter much the greater part of the personal property of the south division was in that district probably thirty five million dollars total ninety nine million dollars deducting forty million dollars for the land and the loss if everything else were destroyed would be sixty million dollars according to the assessor's valuation or if this be equal upon an average of real and personal estate to one-half the actual cash value which is believed to be quite within the fact an actual loss of a hundred and twenty million dollars similarly the actual loss in the north division is found to be in the vicinity of thirty million dollars but from this calculation must be deducted all of that unburnt portion of assessment district number one between twelfth and harrison streets and a small unburnt district in the northwest corner of the north division from it must also be deducted the value of all personal property saved from the fire to it must be added the loss in the burnt district of the west division thus while the calculation does not assume the character of precision it furnishes a trustworthy approximation showing that a hundred and fifty million dollars will cover the entire destruction of property by the conflagration a survey by streets no better idea of the losses can be obtained than can be got by going over a little in detail the area swept by the fire in the south division as yet and for weeks and months to come no one will be able to enumerate these losses accurately and elaborately beginning not with the point where the fire commenced but at the main branch of the river for convenience let us enumerate the streets and as far as possible recall what was on them what was bought and sold and stored there and by whom they were occupied and first south water street was swept with destructions besom from the south branch to the lake here went down the lumber exchange several elevators with their contents almost innumerable houses stored with flour with apples and butter with lard and pork poultry farm products garden vegetables and on the east half of the street on both sides were wholesale houses stored from cellar to attic with groceries coarse and fine with the products of europe the wines of burgundy and the rhine coffees from south america the west indies and the orient teas piled high like a canton storehouse whiskies the distilled essence of thousands of acres of illinois corn these with all that was left of the fort dearborn buildings were wiped out for the entire length of the street with the peculiar paraphernalia of the street the skids the clogged and choked sidewalks through which buyers wended sinuous where now o oh consignees from the northwest are the products of your labor you may come in thousands as you already have to look after them but they are consigned where no consignee or purchaser will ever see them into oxygen and hydrogen thin air while pursuing its resistless way along this street eating through the vegetables and poultry and fruits and provisions of the northwest more rapidly than the carnivorous tooth of time aided by the forces of decay the fires were also sweeping across the river next take lake street this street which for twenty years has stood as the great business street of chicago was totally destroyed from end to end from the lake to the river with the contents of the houses the principal hide and leather houses occupied the west end next came several heavy hardware and cutlery establishments farm implement establishments and toy shops some of the largest silver and plated ware establishments clothing houses large retail dry goods houses and below dearborn street both sides of the street were occupied for about a quarter of a mile with palatial marble fronted rows where goods were sold only at wholesale tall buildings whose shadows fell entirely across the street and terminated somewhat up the fronts of the opposite side 
these containing millions of dollars worth of goods of all kinds the labor of the loom from sunny france from italy from india and china from the shops of old and of new england were all consigned at last to the general limbo of total destruction at the foot of this street stood several fine hotels the adams the richmond and massasoit houses and the great railroad union depot a marvel of magnitude and art whose picture graces some of the school geographies these with the freight buildings and the warehouses beyond almost to the mouth of the harbor containing freight and stores and grain in quantities that nobody knows and probably never will in the aggregate were all consumed then randolph street followed the lind block stands at the bridge the solitary structure left out of all that was valuable beautiful or grand on this street this was the street where the large hotels stood the sherman house the briggs house the metropolitan the mattison and several others a large number of furniture establishments and toy establishments occupied the west end of the street while the east end was devoted like lake street to wholesale houses including the great auction houses the museum the northwestern engraving company's building and several wholesale grocery establishments together with a miscellaneous business comprising retail establishments banks etc which were all consigned to ruin with the rest washington street from the tunnel to the lake comprised many of the best buildings in the city it was largely devoted to banks offices insurance and real estate dealers on this street was the second presbyterian church the union bank building the merchants insurance building the nevada house the opera house st james's hotel the first national bank the board of trade and a large number of other equally fine blocks almost all of which were marble fronts then all of madison street from the lake to the bridge some of the famous buildings on this street were farwell hall mcvicker's theater the morrison block tribune building stott zeitung building and st mary's church the entire street was built up with blocks such as cannot be excelled in any city monroe street from river to lake having upon it the lombard block the post office the prairie farmer building and a large number of the finest blocks in the city adams street with its cheaper buildings at the west end its academy of design with most of the works of art therein contained its temple of swedenborg the south side reservoir and many other buildings quincy street with its pacific hotel fast approaching completion and its palmer house the pride of everybody with its palaces and its dens of infamy and shame jackson street from the residences of the rich and the elegant trinity church on the east to the less pretentious houses of the working class farther west to the hundreds of dens and holes of darkness at the west were illuminated and oxygenized van buren street with its bridge its magnificent railway depot st paul's church the academy of science building and its blocks of fine residences and acres of poor ones were annihilated congress street with its elegant second congregational church harrison street with its freight house the jones school building and everything else except the methodist church on wabash avenue and the houses on michigan avenue fell before the flames and this was the most southern street which was burned from end to end from the lake to the river these east and west streets only comprise in their description a larger portion of the houses burned on state street stood the magnificent bookstores of griggs and company keen and cook and the western news company field and lighters wholesale dry goods house besides many large wholesale and retail carpet houses jewelry establishments and furniture houses on dearborn street stood the times and the journal newspaper offices the dearborn theater and a considerable number of banks and large office blocks la salle street was built up with many of the finest buildings to be found in the city it was largely occupied by insurance agents real estate brokers lawyers etc 
between washington and randolph streets stood the courthouse which of course shared the general ruin these details are only given to aid the reader in obtaining approximate idea of the losses little was saved except from those houses which were not attacked by the flames until several hours after it was seen to be inevitable that the city was doomed immense quantities of goods were piled upon lake park and upon the grounds of the chicago baseball club pyramids of clothing boots and shoes dry goods and furniture from the houses of the rich dwellers along michigan avenue all of which fell prey to the destroyer the loss of life the loss of life though smaller than could have been predicted in such an extended and such a rapid fire can never yet be fully estimated there have been charred remains at the morgue which were almost unrecognizable as human bodies and as the ruins are lying from two to ten feet deep in places it is impossible to say how many have been buried under them the fact that but few of those who are prominently known are missing must not lead any to believe that there have not been many lost who would be missed only by an exceedingly small circle of friends to obscure themselves to attract much attention the greatest loss of life was in the north division among the wooden buildings where the billows of fire rolled along so rapidly that the victims were engulfed before they were aware that the fire had reached their neighborhood the flames often jumped two or three blocks at once as was the case at the waterworks and lill's brewery which were on fire a long time before any of the adjoining buildings at the waterworks one man crawled into a twenty-inch pipe which was lying in the street and was burned to a crisp to the death record should be added the mortality on the prairies of the northwestern part of the city where many children and babes in arms unsheltered and almost unprotected by garments took cold in the rain of monday night following the fire and died from croup before help could be secured End of section 6. Seven of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Insurance Companies. Part 7. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great Fires of History. Among the great fires of modern history, the mind naturally reverts to the conflagration in london in 1666 as the most destructive relatively such it was for it continued four days and nights and consumed nearly five-sixths of the city within its walls yet although more than thirteen thousand houses of the description then common in the thickly settled portions of the city were destroyed the area laid waste was only four hundred and thirty-six acres or less than a square mile, while the aggregate loss did not exceed sixty million dollars. The city of Moscow, several times before grievously afflicted by fires, was made almost a smoking waste upon its occupation by the French in 1812, when, by order of the Russian governor Rostopchin, it was set on fire in five hundred places at once, and eleven thousand eight hundred and forty houses burned to the ground besides palaces and churches. Hamburg, in Germany, was visited by a fire on the 5th of May, 1842, which continued four days and destroyed one-third of the city. In the United States, the most memorable conflagration, prior to that which has just devastated Chicago, was the Great Fire in New York, in 1835, which extended from east of Broadway and south or below Wall Street, destroying 648 stores, the Merchants' Exchange, and the South Dutch Church, loss estimated at $20 million. Other great fires occurred in Charleston, South Carolina, April 27, 1838, when 1,158 buildings covering 145 acres were burned. In New York, again, September 6, 1839, loss ten million two hundred dollars in pittsburgh april tenth eighteen forty five 
1,000 buildings, loss $6 million. In Quebec, May 28, 1845, 1,500 buildings, and in June of the same year, 1,300 buildings. In New York, July 19, 1845, 302 stores and dwellings, loss $6 million. In Albany, September 9, 1848, 24 acres burned over and 300 buildings destroyed, loss $3 million. In St. Louis, July 9, 1849, 350 buildings, loss $3 million. In San Francisco, May 3, 1851, 2,500 buildings, loss $3.5 million. And again, June 22, 1851, 500 buildings, loss $3 million. And at Portland, Maine, July 4, 1866, when 10,000 people were rendered homeless and 15 millions of property destroyed. What is spared to Chicago? From the Chicago Tribune. Our columns have been so extensively occupied during the past week with reports of the enormous losses of life and property in the late fire that there is some danger that the damage sustained will be overestimated. True, we have seen 2,500 acres in the most central portion of the city swept bare, 20,000 buildings destroyed, and 100,000 persons rendered homeless, the total pecuniary loss being not less than $300 million. But we still have a great deal left. We may roughly estimate the situation as follows. Above 50,000 persons have left the city. Population remaining, 280,000. Five grain elevators were burned, with 1,600,000 bushels of grain, leaving us with 11 grain warehouses intact, containing 5 million bushels. One half of our stocks of pork products were burned up, with the same proportion of flour. Of lumber, 50 million feet were burned. The stock remaining is 240 million feet. Of coal, 80,000 tons were burned up. We have 79,000 tons on hand. Our stock of leather was decreased one quarter, the value of that burned up being $95 million. The greater portion of the stocks of groceries, dry goods, and boots and shoes were burned up, with more than one-half the ready-made clothing, but the quantities destroyed were scarcely equal to more than a three-week supply and are now being rapidly replaced. Not more than 10% of the currency was destroyed by the fire. We have 30,000 houses left standing, and our real estate could not burn up. A careful average of these larger items, with smaller ones that need not be enumerated, shows that the city of Chicago has suffered a loss of not less than 20 nor more than 25 percent of her total assets, real and personal. The loss is a great one, but so far from irretrievable that we may confidently hope to see a return to former prosperity ere long. The ratio of increase during the past 34 years has averaged 10.5 percent per annum. This rate would restore the status of a month ago within three years, making every due allowance for the terrible setback experienced. There can be no doubt that five years hence, at most, the exhibit of population, wealth, commerce, and manufactures will be greater than a month ago. The exact area of the conflagration, from the Chicago Journal. Careful measurements and calculations of the area of the burnt district of the city place its length from its starting point to its place of ending at four and a half miles and its average width a little more than one mile. Along the south side lake shore, however, and westward five blocks, Harrison Street is the southern limit of the conflagration, and the distance from that street to Fullerton Avenue, its northern limit, is only three and a half miles. The point of the fire's beginning on the west side was about one mile south of Harrison Street, 
southwesterly. The number of acres laid waste is not far from 2,300. A pretty careful computation places the number of buildings of all kinds destroyed at 18,000, of which at least 1,500 were substantial business structures. The actual total of the pecuniary losses is estimated at $300 million, but no fair estimate that we have yet seen or heard of places the grand total below $200 million. We still believe the latter will cover all the losses. End of Section 7 Section 8 of The Great Chicago Fire by various authors. The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies. Part 8. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Losses and the Resources of the Companies. In the following pages, we present a list of all the joint stock fire insurance companies in the United States, except a few unimportant companies in the southern states. The list does not include the small mutual companies, which are confined to country towns and a limited business mainly of farmhouse risks, since such companies are not to be counted upon for the transaction of a general business. The list also contains a complete record of all the foreign fire insurance companies which transact a general business in this country. These lists have been carefully compiled from official sources, and the statement of assets of the companies, in each instance, is in accordance with the returns made under oath to the heads of insurance departments of the various states, and by those officials approved as correct after due examination. The statements of losses have been gathered from sources equally to be relied on. We have been especially careful to secure the exact figures, and so far as given they may be relied on. We are receiving fresh information hourly from our office in Chicago, which has been reopened at 450 State Street, and shall issue daily editions of this publication until the record is complete. The use of these facts and figures will be at once apparent to the businessman, who will today realize, as he has never realized before, that without reliable substantial insurance, his house is indeed but built upon loose sand and his business hangs in the balance, at the mercy of the merciless element fire. Without insurance, no business man in this country stands upon a secure footing. Without it, he may be utterly and hopelessly ruined in an hour. The present emergency will doubtless prove of value to him for all time to come, in that it impresses upon him, with a force that he never has hitherto felt, the necessity and the indispensableness of the protection afforded by insurance. In this terrible emergency, it behooves the prudent man to look to it, without a moment's delay, that his property is placed beyond the possibility of loss. The information we give herewith will afford an intelligent guide as to the course he shall pursue, and the companies he shall trust with the most important interests he has in the world. And let us remind the public that it is now no time to haggle about rates. Rates have been too low, and the mushroom companies which pushed the rate below the point of safety in the past have been swept away. The public must not expect that the good companies, which have been so severely tried in this great disaster, will longer continue to stand between new and irretrievable loss for a premium which affords a paltry margin. They must be remunerated for the blow which has been inflicted upon them and the public must expect to pay at least double the rate which they have hitherto paid, if they expect to be insured. And now, one word in behalf of the companies. Although there are a limited few which can boast of a heavy capital, past experience shows that the majority are to be relied on under the severest strain. The Great Fire of thirty-five, which swept New York, the Portland disaster, and now the calamity of Chicago, prove abundantly their elasticity and ability to meet the heaviest drain upon them. There is no financial institution endowed with such recuperative energies, and they meet the claims upon them as a class with the most decided and praiseworthy promptness. The public can see from the papers as they are daily issued 
how nobly the fire underwriters of this country are meeting the present crisis and we submit that they are entitled to the largest degree of public confidence and the most generous public support let no one try to beat down the rates they fix upon the risks offered to them their offices are overcrowded their hands are full they will demand no more than they are justified in asking and it is every insurer's duty to accept without cavil the advanced rate which the severest experience has rendered it necessary to impose note here in the text follow eight pages of tables in which are listed alphabetically all of the insurance companies referred to in the text giving for each one its name the year it was organized where its head office is located the amount of its capital the amount of its assets on january first eighteen seventy one and the amount of its losses in the chicago fire a final concluding table is a summary which shows the aggregate loss of all the insurance companies by state as well as the foreign insurance companies end note the hartford companies from the hartford courant the aggregate capital of the hartford fire insurance companies is six million one hundred thousand dollars its market value last week was twelve million eight hundred and ninety four thousand dollars the total assets last new year's day were thirteen million two hundred and eighty seven thousand eight hundred and sixty five dollars and when the chicago fire broke out the total was doubtless at least fourteen million the total income in eighteen seventy was nine million two hundred and thirty seven thousand eight hundred and twenty one dollars the market value indicated the confident expectation of stockholders and the market that not less than ten per cent on that market value or over a million and a quarter annually might be expected in dividends several millions are going directly from hartford to chicago the depreciation in the present market values of the stocks will doubtless be many millions it is a terrible loss but there is likewise a grand opportunity the best of forty years past or of a generation to come to put our insurance business upon a greatly honorable and greatly profitable basis let us take the oldest company the hartford for illustration it will meet all its obligations without impairing its capital and doubtless with a large share of its surplus left but suppose it has lost not alone its surplus of nearly two millions but its capital of a million also there could be no better investment for its stockholders than to consider themselves organizing anew and to take from their pockets another million for new capital in order to keep the old name going and they could afford to pay a million for the franchise at that the same can be said of any hartford company with an established reputation and a good set of officers this is the era of new departures and there is clearly to be a new departure in the business of insurance there will be certain great advantages over the past one there will be less competition on the part of inferior companies pursuing a weak and narrow-minded policy of very low rates many such companies especially in the west have ended their course two rates will necessarily advance and with the cheerful consent of the insured hereafter people will willingly pay companies that pass this ordeal not only for the pleasure of holding a policy but something for the solid assurance of being really protected short-sighted men will grumble less at bloated monopolies after having felt the value of a great surplus rolled up for a day of need three chicago and other cities as well have learned an awful lesson and there will be greater care in rebuilding aided by stricter local legislation and more watchful supervision the hazard will be reduced four much of the nonsensical and wicked jealousy of foreign companies as those of sister states are called will pass away and with it will go the hostile legislation so directly at war with sound economical principles and the true spirit of unity end of section eight end of the first pamphlet the chicago fire and the fire insurance companies
Section 9 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Mrs. Leary's Cow, A Legend of Chicago by C. C. Hine This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Leary's Cow, A Legend of Chicago by C. C. Hine Presented by the Black River Insurance Company, Watertown, New York, 1872 Shortly after the great Chicago fire, there appeared a dismal-looking photograph card of this celebrated bovine, on the reverse of which was printed this remarkable legend. Origin of the Chicago Fire On the other side of this card will be found a lifelike picture of Mrs. Leary and the cow that kicked over the lamp that caused the great fire in Chicago. Mrs. Leary got her living by selling milk. She had five cows, and kept them in her barn on Decoven Street, on the west side of the river. A neighbor woman called on her for a pint of milk at nine o'clock Sunday night, October 8th, and Mrs. Leary, having sold all she had, went to the barn with a lamp to make a further draft on her best cow. The cow, as seen by the picture, being a spirited animal, became indignant at the attempt, kicked over the lamp, setting the barn on fire and thus inaugurated the greatest fire the world has ever seen. Mrs. Leary's Cow This is the cow at the Leary back gate, where she stood on the night of October the 8th, with her old crumpled horn and belligerent hoof, warning all neighbor women to keep well aloof. Ah, this is the cow with the crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn, that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is Chicago, all blasted and burned, the paradise whither insurance men turned, but from which they now bring sad faces away, sorely vexed with the losses they're called on to pay, since the fire fiend encircled the city that day. And they swear at the cow with the crumpled horn, that kicked over the lamp, that set fire to the barn, that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is the frame range of best northern pine, the banquet on which hungry flames love to dine, which agents so oft manage not to decline, but write in their slop bowls a moderate line, because, don't you see, the commission's so fine? Ha! This is the range which delighted to carry the passenger flames or the devil's own ferry, and utilize mischief by spreading it faster than men could compete with the fearful disaster. How sad and how strange are the memories now, which hang round the heels of that old leery cow, that wretched old cow with the crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is the company, gloomy and glum, which admits that it has some, few, losses, yes, some, but its officers think their best motto is mum, as they stroke their gray chins and look wise and sing dumb, while inside they are praying, good Lord, please deliver our souls from the fear of old Miller's receiver, and they view with the most acrimonious hate that regurgitant cow at O'Leary's back gate, as she stood on the night of October the 8th, when she kicked at the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is the statement the company made, directors and officers thickly arrayed, to soften the jar as they strike the upgrade, where the millions of losses will have to be paid. Our agency records, we deeply regret, are burned at Chicago, are out in the wet, or else there is, hmm, there is some slight impediment, some something or other, some sand or some sediment, has got in the keyhole, disordered the lock, or razzied the dividends, watered the stock, or some trifling thing, not yet quite in sight. But the company, sir, is all right is all right. Our surplus is safe, and our stock is intact. Our losses are all reinsured. Why, in fact, we never, in all our official career, 
felt more gay and festive, more full of good cheer. Just put up the rates and go on with the biz. These losses will all be arranged with a whiz. This thing we will have straightened out in a jiffy, and the next that you'll hear will be ten percent divvy. But you ought to have seen them when in the back room they poured out anathemas like a mill flume on that old leery cow with the crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is November, a month from the fire, and the ascertained losses reach higher and higher. As the figures go up, the long faces go down, till the month-ago boaster appears like a clown. The trick of deception is voted a sham. The people say, Fraud! And the agents say, Damn! And so the grim old receivers call round for the keys, the assets, the papers, the books, if you please. Of all unwelcome things that this world ever saw, the bitterest is a compulsory craw. For a large swelling dignity, proud and high-born, who claims that his status is bright as the morn, to get down and meekly acknowledge the corn, and squeeze himself through the small end of a horn, suggests that a little less premature crowing, a little more system, a little more knowing, some better-kept books, and more accurate showing, are best in the long run for our underwriters, to save them the sneers and the jeers of backbiters the scoffs of the public, the quips of the writers, and a toss from the cow with the crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is the claimant, so pure and so mild, with his heart and his manners as bland as a child, whose amiability never is riled, and whose modest demands with his lost proofs are filed. His property cost, as he shows from his deeds, a sum which ten thousand times over exceeds the might of insurance for which he now pleads. His goods, to be sure, they were mostly sold out. His building within was a shell, and without was veneered with cheap stone, or thin iron, or grout. But his word, bless my soul, who could harbor a doubt? its truthfulness or its exactness about. So he pockets his funds, and he rolls up his eyes, this mild-mannered man, with a cheerful surprise, and he rubs his two hands with an innocent glee, which would do, I am sure, your heart good for to see. And he blesses the cow with the crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is an adjuster. Now open your eyes. A man whom the trade of rapacity flies. He will cut down your claims. He will cut up your proofs. He will riddle your case through its warps and its woofs. And search all your houses from cellars to roofs. For a sliver by which he may fasten a quibble and curtail your claim to a bite or a nibble. And then, when you think he is ready for payment, he will make you regret you were ever a claimant by charging you discount for those sixty days, or vexing you further with needless delays. These awful adjusters, they should be ashamed to ply a vocation so loudly defamed. What's the good of insurance if not to pay losses? And why all these questions and bothers and crosses? And why are we hampered and why are we checked? Insurers can claim, if you'll only reflect, no rights which it is not our right to reject, no rights which the people are bound to respect. They must smile and be patient, and out with their purses, and take what we give them, our kicks or our curses, bow down to the cow with the old crumpled horn that kicked over the lamp that set fire to the barn that caused the great fire in Chicago. This is insurance. Now, satire, farewell. For the woes which the fire-stricken city befell Must have rung like the clang of a destiny knell. 
through the years of prostration and clog and delay, which would drag unsupportable all the sad way, through which her redemption and rising must lay, had insurance not sped like an angel that brings relief in her hands and delight on her wings. All honor we give to the craft that we love. It has for its motto the word from above, the word spoken erst by omnipotent love. The burdens of each in insurance we bear, and its benefits all its participants share. End of Section 9 Mrs. Leary's Cow, A Legend of Chicago by C. C. Hine of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society. Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Special Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, 1871. Report. The Great Fire in Chicago occurred on Sunday and Monday, October 8th and 9th. On the 13th, the Mayor of Chicago, by the following proclamation, committed to the Chicago Relief and Aid Society the work of dispensing the funds subscribed and provisions contributed for the sufferers from all parts of the civilized world. Proclamation I have deemed it best for the interests of the city to turn over to the Chicago Relief and Aid Society all contributions for the suffering people of this city. This society is an incorporated and old established organization, having possessed for many years the entire confidence of our community, and is familiar with the work to be done. The regular force of this society is inadequate to this immense work, but they will rapidly enlarge and extend the same, by adding prominent citizens to the respective committees, and I call upon all citizens to aid this organization in every possible way. I also confer upon them a continuance of the same power heretofore exercised by the Citizens Committee, namely the power to impress teams and labor, and procure quarters, so far as may be necessary, for the transportation and distribution of contributions, and care of the sick and disabled. General Sheridan desires this arrangement, and has promised to cooperate with the association. It will be seen, from the plan of the work, which is detailed below, that every precaution has been taken in regard to the disposition of contributions. R. B. Mason, Mayor Up to the date of this proclamation, the work had been conducted by a committee of citizens, who, in conformity with the mayor's proclamation, turned over to this society the funds and material at their disposal by the following communication. Chicago, September 17, 1871 Wirt Dexter, Esquire, Chairman, Executive Committee, Chicago Relief and Aid Society Sir, The General Relief Committee of which we were chairman and secretary, respectively, with headquarters at the corner of Washington and Ann Streets, discontinued all official action as a committee on Saturday evening last, the 14th, and have since referred all official matters coming to us to your committee. We supposed that this fact was generally known, and we now make this formal statement, that you may be assured that there has not been, nor can be, any conflict on our part to possibly embarrass your committee in the full control and direction of all matters pertaining to the relief of the destitute in our midst. Respectfully, Orrin E. Moore, Chairman, C. B. Hotchkiss, Secretary. The Chicago Relief and Aid Society has been for many years, irrespective of sect or party or nationality, the medium for the distribution of the general charities of Chicago, under the following charter, granted by the legislature of the state of Illinois. An Act to Incorporate the Chicago Relief and Aid Society. Section 1. 
be it enacted by the people of the state of illinois represented in the general assembly that edwin c learned mark skinner edward i tinkham joseph d webster joseph t ryerson isaac n arnold norman b judd john h dunham a h Mueller, samuel s greeley b f cook n s davis george w dole george w higginson john h kinsey john woodbridge jr erastus s williams philo carpenter george w gage s s hayes henry farnham william h brown philip j wardner and their associates and successors be and they are hereby created a body politic and corporate under the name of the chicago relief and aid society and by that name to remain in perpetual succession with power to contract and be contracted with to sue and be sued to acquire hold and convey property real personal or mixed to have and use a common seal and to alter the same at pleasure to make and alter by-laws for the government of the corporation its officers agents and servants section two the objects of this corporation shall be strictly of an eleemosynary nature they shall be to provide a permanent efficient and practical mode of administering and distributing the private charities of the city of chicago to examine and establish the necessary means for obtaining full and reliable information of the condition and wants of the poor of said city, and putting into practical and efficient operation the best system of relieving and preventing want and pauperism therein. Section 3. The said corporation shall be located in the city of Chicago, and the persons named in the first section and their associates or any ten of them, shall have power to hold a meeting thereof, and organize said institution by the appointment of a board of directors and the establishment of such constitution and by-laws as they shall deem expedient. Section 4. The said corporation shall have power to locate and erect, or to lease, the necessary building or buildings, and lot or lots, and employ the necessary agents and officers that may be requisite to carry into full effect the purposes of this act also to receive by gift grant devise or bequest property real personal or mixed and to hold and use the same for the purposes of the institution section five all money and property received by said association shall be faithfully applied to the purposes in this act specified and it shall be lawful for the said corporation to secure the faithful collection custody and distribution of its funds and other property by such bonds and other securities as the board of directors shall require and any officer agent or member of said corporation who shall fraudulently embezzle or appropriate to his own use any of the funds or property of the said corporation shall be deemed guilty of larceny and liable to be indicted and punished accordingly section six the business of said company shall be managed by a board of directors to consist of not less than five members and by such other officers and agents as said board shall appoint the first board of directors shall be elected by the persons named in the first section or such of them not less than ten who shall attend a meeting to be held in chicago at a time and place of which notice shall be given by any three of said persons and the persons elected directors at such a time shall hold their offices for one year and until others are appointed in their places and shall elect their own officers and have power to appoint and remove all the other agents officers and servants employed by said corporation section seven this act shall be in force from and after its passage section eight that all property of whatsoever kind and description belonging to said corporation 
shall be and remain free and exempt from all taxes and assessments for state, county, or city purposes. Section 9. It shall be the duty of the said Board of Directors to make a report at least once a year to the City Council of Chicago, giving a full account of all their doings, a statement of their receipts and expenditures verified under oath, also of the property owned by said corporation and the uses to which the same is appropriated, also a list of all the members of said company and of all persons who have contributed to the objects of the same with the amount of their respective contributions, together with such information as they may have acquired concerning the condition and wants of the poor of said city and the plans and intentions of the said corporation which report shall be published in the official paper of the city, and in such other manner for general circulation as the City Council shall direct. Section 10. It shall be lawful for the City Council of Chicago to appropriate from time to time such sums of money as they shall deem expedient to aid in carrying out the charitable purposes of said corporation, also to allow said corporation to occupy without rent any lot belonging to the city, for the storage of wood, coal, or other supplies intended for charitable distribution, or for any other purpose necessary or desirable to carry out the objects herein specified. Section 11. It shall be the duty of the said corporation to establish, as soon as may be, one or more offices, depots, or stations, in a suitable and convenient place or places in said city, of the location of which public notice shall be given, and continued for such time as may be needful, to cause the same to be generally known in the city, at which places officers or agents of the corporation shall be in attendance, for the purpose of carrying out the purposes of this Act, in such manner and under such regulations as the Board of Directors may direct. Section 12. The Mayor of the City of Chicago shall ex officio be a member of the Board of Directors of said corporation. Section 13. It shall be lawful for the Board of Directors to fix the amount, if any, which shall be paid to entitle any person to become a member of said corporation, also to tax each member of said corporation annually a sum not exceeding $10, to aid in defraying the permanent expenses of said corporation, also to make such persons, whether residing in said city or elsewhere, who shall, by their philanthropy and benevolence, be adjudged by the board to be deserving of such distinction, honorary members of said association, and to establish life memberships therein by the payment of such amount as the board shall determine, which life memberships shall be free from any annual assessments. Section 14. The Board of Directors shall have power to establish such by-laws for the proper management of the business of said Board and such corporation, as they may deem expedient, and to alter, add to, and amend the same. Samuel Holmes, Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Wood, Speaker of the Senate. Approved, February 16, 1857, William H. Bissell. In conformity with the provision of the Charter in that regard, this society has always made an annual report, under oath of its proper officer, to the Common Council of the City of Chicago, of its receipts, disbursements, and general doings. In accordance with the above proclamation of the Mayor, it now accepted the enlarged trust created by this great emergency, and assumed on the 15th of October the work of the care of the sufferers by the late fire. It established its headquarters at once at Standard Hall, and published the following general plan of organization referred to in the proclamation. General Plan of Work of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society Committee Number 1 On Receiving, Storing, and Sorting Supplies and Dealing Out upon requisitions from other committees. Marie Nelson, Chairman, aided by General Hardy. 
Number 2. Committee on Shelter to provide tents and barracks. T. M. Avery, Chairman. Number 3. Committee on Employment to provide labor for able-bodied applicants. Chairman N. K. Fairbanks. Number 4. Committee on Transportation to provide passes for persons and freight accommodations for supplies. Chairman George M. Pullman. Number 5. Committee on Reception and Correspondence to receive visitors and answer all dispatches and letters. Chairman Wirt Dexter. Number 6. Committee on Distribution of Food, Clothing, and Fuel. O. C. Gibbs, Superintendent of Relief and Aid Society, Chairman. Number 7. Committee on Sick, Sanitary, and Hospital Measures. Dr. H. A. Johnson, Chairman. Number 8. Executive Committee. Consisting of R. B. Mason, the Mayor, and the City Comptroller, the President and Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, together with the Chairman of each of the foregoing committees, shall constitute an auditing committee and have control of all contributions. No bills to be paid unless upon checks or drafts signed by the President or Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Relief and Aid Society, countersigned by R. B. Mason, Mayor. The Chairman of each committee will fill up from citizens who shall tender their services his own committee, making it as large as the magnitude of the work may require, and be responsible for its doings. The clergymen of the city are requested to organize an associate board of directors to that of the Relief and Aid Society, and through an executive committee of their own appointment, communicate with our committees. We recommend the formation of local societies by citizens, and request them through their officers to communicate with the chairman of the foregoing committees on all matters falling under the respective work of said committees. The work of distribution, as now proceeding, will go on until our committees are supplied with force to relieve the present workers, but we request all persons engaged in the work to stop hasty distributions and give applications as much examination as possible, to the end that we may not waste the generous aid pouring in, as the work of relief is not for a week or a month, but for the whole of the coming winter and to a great extent for even a longer period. The business offices of all the committees, except the Executive Committee and Committees of Reception and Correspondence and Transportation, will be at 409 West Washington Street, just west of Elizabeth. No relief will be administered at these offices, they being solely for the transaction of committee business. Applications for passes on railroads will be acted upon at one or more places to be designated by the chairman of that committee. The Office of the Executive Committee and Committee on Reception and Correspondence, and the general business of the Committee on Transportation, will be at Standard Hall, corner 13th Street and Michigan Avenue. Home contributions of money will be receipted for at Standard Hall. Chicago Relief and Aid Society Henry W. King, President, Wirt Dexter, Chairman, Executive Committee. The original working plan, as above published, was found, in some respects, inconvenient, and at the annual meeting of the Society it was modified to this extent. An Executive Committee, chosen by the Board of Directors from their own number, is invested with power to transact all business, subject to the supervision of the Board. This committee is composed of the heads of the committees and departments. No member of the Executive Committee or the Board of Directors receives any compensation for his services. The Executive Committee, with one or two exceptions, give their entire time to the work. End of Section 10 
Section 11 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society Part 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shelter The first immediate necessity to be relieved, of course, was food, and in some measure clothing but close following upon it was the need of shelter, for it was plain that the thousands who lay upon the ground, on the prairie whither they had fled, in the dooryards and empty lots of the city, must have immediate protection. The exigency was imperative. The great fire at Portland, the last in this country which can in any degree be compared to that of Chicago, occurred on the 4th of July, leaving the greater portion of the summer in which to prepare for winter. But we were on the verge of the most inclement season of the year, and those familiar with the great severity of our winters, and our exposed situation, between the open prairie on one side and the lake on the other, can understand how the question of shelter pressed upon us. The churches and schoolhouses were, at first, thrown open to those who had no better place of refuge. But these, of course, could be only temporary resting places. Some rude barracks were, at the outset, put up by the Citizens' Committee, which could only answer for immediate protection from the weather. But such structures, even if well built, were open to grave objections as the homes of forty or fifty thousand people in the winter. So large a number, brought into promiscuous and involuntary association, would almost certainly engender disease and promote idleness, disorder, and vice, and be dangerous to themselves and to the neighborhood in which they might be placed. Such buildings could only be put up by sufferance upon land to which the occupants could obtain no title, could have no interest in improving and from which they would undoubtedly be removed in the spring, if not sooner, by the actual owners. To construct barracks for the houseless, therefore, was only to postpone the solution of the problem for a few months, to find us then with a large class of permanent poor still without homes, and demoralized by a winter of dependence and evil communications. A small number, under stringent police and sanitary rule, might be kept in health and comfort and order in barracks. But the system would be manifestly a bad one for so large a number of people, and particularly for the class who made much the larger proportion of those who were sufferers by the fire. These were mechanics and the better class of laboring people, thrifty, domestic, and respectable, whose skill and labor are indispensable in rebuilding the city and most of whom had accumulated enough to become the owners of their own homesteads, either as proprietors or lessees of the lots. To restore them to these homes would be to raise them at once from depression and anxiety, if not despair, to hope, renewed energy, and comparative prosperity. With all the incentives to industry left them, and with the conscious pride and independence of still living under their own roof-tree, they would thus settle for themselves, and in the best way, the question of title to land, and restore value to their real estate by proving it to be as desirable for occupation as before the fire. It was decided, therefore, to put in barracks the minimum number who could not otherwise be provided for, and to provide small but comfortable houses for the rest, much the larger proportion, who had families, and who had owned or had leases of the lots where they had previously resided. Messrs. T. M. Avery and T. W. Harvey, members of the board of directors of this society, were at once put at the head of a shelter committee, and the result of their labors is even more successful and encouraging than the most sanguine had anticipated. Isolated Houses the Bureau of the Shelter Committee is very thoroughly organized with an efficient corps of clerks and examiners, through whom the claim of the applicant goes for a careful and thorough examination, with all possible checks to detect imposition, while all are listened to with the utmost sympathy and patience. 
The houses given are of two sizes, one of 20 by 16 feet for families of more than three persons, the other of 12 by 16 feet for families of three only. The floor joists are of 2 by 6 inch timber, covered with a flooring of planed and matched boards. The studding is of 2 by 4 inches, covered with inch boards and battened on the outside. The inside walls are lined with thick felt paper, and each house has a double iron chimney, two paneled doors, three windows, and a partition to be put up where the occupant pleases. The establishment is completed in a simple but sufficient way for comfortable living, by the addition of a cooking stove and utensils, several chairs, a table, bedstead, bedding, and sufficient crockery for the use of the family, and the total cost of the house when thus furnished is a hundred and twenty-five dollars. The majority of those who receive the prepared material for these houses are mechanics enough to put them together for themselves, or have the means to hire builders. But for the large class of widows, infirm, or otherwise helpless persons, the house is built and put in complete readiness for the proposed tenant by the committee. There were, on Saturday the 18th inst, 5,497 of these houses put up or in process of erection, most of which are completed and occupied. The applications for them, at the same date, numbered 7,246, and it is calculated that the demand for them, which it will be prudent for the society to meet with the means at their disposal, will be about 8,000. This will provide, at the usual estimate of five to a family, and as the houses chosen are almost entirely of the larger size, respectable and comfortable homes for from thirty-five to forty thousand persons. Where the committee think that the circumstances justify it, the house and its furnishings are an outright gift. In the majority of applications this is the case. But where the committee have reason to know or to believe that the applicant has means that will become available, or that he will soon be able to command, he is requested to give an obligation to repay in one year, but without interest, three-fourths of the value advanced him. So far is this from being considered a hardship, that the applicant in most cases prefers to accept the obligation to return the money, that it may again be used to aid others who may be in need, as it frees him from being the recipient of public bounty, and allows him to retain an honorable feeling of independence. He may refund the amount before the year expires, if it shall suit his convenience. But if it shall appear, at the end of that time, upon a reinvestigation of the case, that he is evidently unable to refund it, he is simply considered by the committee as belonging to that class from which no return could be expected for bounty bestowed. The actual rental of these houses may be estimated as worth ten dollars per month based upon what the society is paying, in many instances, for similar accommodations to keep people from being turned out of doors. This rental for six months would amount to sixty dollars, and as the cost of the shelter houses, exclusive of furniture, is nearly one hundred dollars, they will have paid by the first of May next sixty per cent of their cost. It must not be understood, however, that this is a rental charged, but only a rental estimated, and which is saved to the owner of the house in six months. In no case is any rent taken from the occupants of these houses. The stock of lumber destroyed in Chicago by the fire was not less than sixty-five millions of feet, and the supply destroyed in the lumber regions ready for shipment to this market was also immense. The price of lumber, consequently, has rapidly enhanced, and since the 26th of October has been twenty dollars per thousand. By the wise forethought and activity of the Shelter Committee, this rise in value was anticipated, and all their purchases have been made at an average price of sixteen dollars and fifty cents per thousand. They have used, thus far, nearly twenty-seven millions of feet, with this large saving in cost. THE BARRACKS. 
Besides the isolated houses, there are in different sections of the city four barracks, in which are lodged one thousand families. They are mainly of the class who have not hitherto lived in houses of their own, but in rooms in tenement houses. Each family in these barracks has two separate rooms to itself, and they are furnished in precisely the same way with the isolated houses. Their occupants are undoubtedly very nearly, if not quite, as comfortable as they were before the fire, and as only one thousand two hundred and fifty people are gathered together in one community, and these are under the constant and careful supervision of medical and police superintendents, their moral and sanitary condition is unquestionably better than that which has heretofore obtained in that class. There has been among them but a single death up to the 25th of November. End of section 11 12 of the Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 3. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Supply and Distribution In the confusion and disorder of the first few days of the fire, the only one practicable rule, and that one of imperative necessity, was that the hungry should be fed. The bountiful supplies which began to pour in from all parts of the country, while the fire was still burning, fortunately made it possible to give food to all who asked for it. Churches and school buildings were used as depots and distributing offices, and all who asked received, with such order and economy as it was possible to establish in so sudden an emergency. Discrimination, however, was impossible and bounty fell upon the deserving and the undeserving, as certainly as that the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. For in a calamity that was so universal, and where tens of thousands were faint for want of bread, there was neither the leisure nor the disposition for careful scrutiny. Some waste was inevitable, but it was of more consequence that none should suffer from want, than that a few who were not in need should not become successful impostors but to reduce the work of relief to a system for the sake of economy in the ways and means, to secure to the real sufferers the needed aid, to detect and defeat imposition, to aid in establishing order by withholding encouragement to idleness, was, after giving food to all who said they were hungry, the first object of the committee. The task was immense, for an army of a hundred thousand, not of men only, with some power of endurance, but of men, women, and children, with their aged, their sick, their helpless, and their infirm, was suddenly thrown upon the hands of the society, and there was neither commissariat, nor organization, nor cohesion, nor even distinct and separate locality to fall back upon. The first step was to district the city, under the direction of O. C. Gibbs, who for years had been superintendent of the Relief and Aid Society, and it was accordingly divided into five large districts, made as nearly equal as possible with regard to population. These were subdivided, at first, into thirteen smaller sub-districts, but which are now, as rearranged from time to time, and as rations are given out at longer intervals, six only. The whole are under the general superintendent, but to each district is given a superintendent with supervision over his whole district, and to each sub-district a sub-superintendent with supervision over his immediate depot of supplies. Sufficient assistance is given to each superintendent, averaging about ninety men and women to each district, the duties of a part of whom are to administer to the wants of applicants for food and clothing, courteously and kindly, but with a firm adherence to the rules established to guard against extravagant or injudicious distribution, the duplication of relief or pretended want. Another part of this force is made up of a corps of visitors who are constantly busy in visiting all whose names are registered in the books at the offices of the relief stations, 
and in searching for sufferers who need aid but do not know where to find it. Registration was resorted to at the outset, both as an act of mercy and as a measure of precaution, and a rule was established at the earliest practicable moment, by which none were allowed to take supplies from the depots without full entry of name, residence, condition, and other circumstances which would identify the applicant. It is the business of the visitor to keep himself constantly informed as to all the persons who are thus entered in his district, and to make periodical returns at the office. He is to learn by observation and inquiry the exact condition of the registered, whether they are well or ill, whether they are idle or industrious, whether they are voluntarily idle, in which case they are peremptorily cut off from aid, whether they are entitled to entire or only partial support, whether they have other means of support than public bounty, and in short any circumstances in relation to their condition or habits or character, which will be a guide as to the care which should be given them at the stations. There a ledger account is opened with each of them, in which appear the returns of the visitors, the supplies given, with their dates, and when they were cut off if discontinued, and the reasons why. The superintendents are required to keep a strict account of all their requisitions of supplies, as well as of their distribution, and as they are accountable for a judicious and energetic discharge of their duties to the general superintendent, so they hold their own subordinates strictly accountable for all their actions. Full and careful reports are made daily from each district, and the superintendents meet one evening in the week with the executive committee to make or hear suggestions, to answer criticism or complaints, to report progress, and suggest improvement, if possible, in the working machinery. The districts are frequently visited by a general inspector to examine into their condition and management and a committee on complaints is always ready at headquarters to listen to any complaints of neglect or improper treatment, and to provide for their immediate correction, if found on inquiry to be well founded. It has taken a good deal of time to bring into systematic condition a complicated business of this sort, which was in fact getting in running order under every possible disadvantage of want of preparation as many large commercial establishments as there are warehouses, bureaus, and relief stations at the various points. But on the whole the committee believe that no better plan than that which they have adopted can be devised to carry on the work in their hands, wisely, economically, effectively, and humanely, that the relief given injudiciously or unnecessarily will be reduced to the smallest possible percentage, while none are deprived of it who are justly entitled to it. In addition to the several districts of the city proper, there is a sixth district which includes all that portion of Cook County outside the city limits, which is under precisely the same rules and regulations with the rest, and has a similar supervision for such of the sufferers by the fire as may have found refuge in the other towns in the county. The subjoined table is a summary of the statements made by the superintendents of the six districts for the weeks ending November 18th and 25th. By them will be seen the number of families in need of aid at those dates, and the fluctuations that have taken place in the course of the two weeks. Note. At this point in the text there is introduced a table entitled Statement of Families Aided. Here will be read only the totals from this table, but let it be noted that the table includes a breakdown of all these figures for each of the six districts. End of note. Statement of Families Aided. Totals. Number of families reported receiving aid November 11th. 12,765. Number added from November 11th to November 18th, 2,105. Number discontinued from November 11th to November 18th, 733. 
Number of families receiving aid on November 18, 14,137. The number of families added during the week between November 18 and 25, 2,471. The number of families to whom aid was discontinued during that week, 1,486. Leaving the number of families receiving aid on November 25th, 15,122. The number of families aided from the time the records were complete to November 11th was 18,478. Of these, 2,470 asked only for stove, bedding, and clothing. The other 16,000 required food, as well as other necessaries. It will be observed that from November 11th to November 18th, there was an increase of 1,372 families, and from November 18th to November 25th, an increase of 985. This is owing, doubtless, to the increasing severity of the weather, and is a fair indication of what may be expected for months to come, as the cold becomes more intense and the demand for labor decreases. As a large part of the business portion of Chicago was destroyed by the fire, hundreds of families are destitute whose homes were not consumed, but who drew their support from occupation in the shops and manufactories of various sorts. RATIONS Food was given at first not only indiscriminately, but in uncertain quantities, for want of conveniences in measuring and weighing. As soon as possible, however, it was reduced to fixed rations, and as the system of distribution was perfected, they were given out at intervals of two or three days, and now of a week. The following ration, for a family of five persons, has been found to be sufficient for one week. At first bread was given instead of flour, as the people had few conveniences for cooking, at an increased cost of forty-two cents to the ration. This is now almost wholly saved, as most of the applicants are supplied with stoves, and can bake their own bread. Crackers for the first few days were substituted for bread where the supply of bread was insufficient. All the crackers used, however, were contributions from abroad. Coffee or tea is given, as the applicant prefers, but tea, which is the cheaper, is the more usually chosen. The cost of the ordinary weekly ration given for a family of five is one dollar and ninety-eight cents, as shown by the following exhibit. Exhibit of the amount and cost of one week's rations for two adults and three children. Three pounds pork at five and a half cents, sixteen and a half cents. Six pounds beef at five cents, thirty cents. 14 pounds flour at 3 cents, 42 cents, 1 and a quarter peck potatoes at 20 cents, 25 cents, a quarter pound tea at 80 cents, 20 cents, 1 and a half pounds sugar at 11 cents, 16 and a half cents, 1 and a quarter pound rice at 8 cents, or three and a half pounds beans at three and three quarter cents, twelve cents. One and a quarter pound soap at seven cents, nine cents. One and a half pound dried apples at eight cents, twelve cents. Three pound fresh beef at five cents, fifteen cents. Total one dollar and ninety eight cents. If bread, at four cents per pound, is used instead of flour, the cost is increased forty-two cents. If crackers, at seven cents per pound, one dollar and five cents. If one and a half pounds coffee, instead of tea, seventeen cents. To the cost of the weekly ration of food for a family of five should be added the allowance of one ton of coal a month, or a quarter of a ton a week. Fortunately for such an exigency as this, the supply of bituminous coal for Chicago is ample, through the Wilmington Coal Company, which owns and works extensive coal mines in Will County, Illinois, 
with sufficient means of transportation at their command over the alton st louis and chicago road with this company the committee has made a contract for the delivery of coal by the ton or half ton at the door for four dollars and fifty cents per ton this brings the weekly cost of coal for the family at one dollar twelve and a half cents which added to the cost of the weekly ration brings the cost of food and fuel at three dollars ten and a half cents as the demand for fuel is as constant and next in importance to that of food a large depot of coal from other sources is kept in reserve for emergencies as in case of interruption to railroad transportation by snowstorms or other causes during the winter clothing the demand for clothing has been and continues to be incessant and immense the larger proportion of those who were sufferers by the fire lost all their personal apparel and their household goods immediate and urgent need was only very partially met by the bountiful supplies which were sent forward from all quarters much of this supply was of second-hand summer clothing which was all that people could lay their hands on in the first emergency it answered a good though only a temporary purpose and the necessity of substituting for it better and warmer garments is constant and imperative the markets of this country cannot supply the demand for blankets alone where the supply of ready-made clothing has been insufficient peace goods are given out in measured quantity to applicants to make up for themselves in this work great assistance is rendered by associations of ladies as the ladies relief and aid society the ladies industrial aid society of st john's church the ladies christian union ladies society of park avenue church and ladies society of the home of the friendless all of whom employ a large number of sewing women thrown out of employment by the fire in making up garments bed comforters bed ticks and other articles from peace goods supplied by the relief committee and returned thus manufactured to the several depots for distribution but a comparatively small portion of those in need of warm and sufficient clothing for the winter is as yet supplied and the labor and expenditure to meet this want must be very large for some time to come of the actual quantity received by gift from abroad and distributed it is impossible to make a detailed statement as much of that received was given out in the first calamitous days of destitution to all comers and without count the united states government through the active efforts of general sheridan has furnished us seven thousand blankets and has also on the way for our use five thousand each of undershirts drawers and socks we are promised by president grant through the hon w w belknap secretary of war who has recently visited chicago such further supplies as we may need so far as the government may have them in store this branch of the work however is being reduced to a system like the rest and the following table is condensed from the reports of the several districts for the week ending november twenty fifth giving the number distributed of several articles of prime necessity to it is added the number previously reported since an accurate record was kept note here is appended in the text a table entitled distribution of articles for the week ending november twenty fifth here will be read only the totals but let it be noted that the chart includes a breakdown of all these figures for each of the six districts. End of note. Distribution of articles for the week ending November 25th. Totals. Mattresses, 10,737. Blankets, 25,339. Tons of coal, 4,653 stoves 4,459, shoes 22,581, men's wear 54,729, women's wear 65,986, children's wear 44,937.
the above table does not include the stoves and mattresses given out by the shelter committee who furnished both articles to the large proportion of their houses and the barracks neither does it include the furniture and crockery both large items of expenditure the aggregate of which is not yet reached end of section twelve Section 13 of the Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 4 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Payrolls The cost of handling this large business necessarily varies from week to week, as the number of families asking for aid increases or diminishes. The payrolls for the week ending November 18th may be taken as a fair average of present expenditure. That for the 6th District, which is the rural portion of Cook County, outside the city limits, is not included in this table, as that report for the week was not received in season. That, however, is comparatively insignificant, as the number of persons needing aid there is small. Neither are the expenditures of the Shelter Committee in the business of their Bureau included, as that is properly charged to a separate account, which must be closed in a few days or weeks, and should not be included in the current expenses of the Society, which will continue through the winter. The clerical force employed by that Committee is large, but temporary only. Payrolls for the week ending November 18th District 1 142 persons employed, amount $1,549. District 2, persons employed, 116, amount $1,190.17. District 3, persons employed, 106, amount $1,347.75. District 4, persons employed, 50, amount $531.82. District 5, persons employed, 75, amount $855.66. Special Bureau, persons employed, 9, amount $118.50. Superintendent's salaries, $225.00. Warehousemen receiving storing and delivering supplies, 111 persons employed, amount $1,259.87. Transportation, $2,148.87. Total for distribution, $9,226.64. Employment Bureau, two persons employed, $36. Clerks in offices of Treasurer, Auditor, Transportation Committee, Purchasing Committee, and Executive Committee, 32 persons employed, $496.34. Total general business, $9,758.98. The Bureau of Special Relief no branch of the work has given the committee so much anxiety and perplexity as that which has come to be known as the Bureau of Special Relief. Among the sufferers by the fire is a large class of persons who, it was soon apparent, would not be reached by the established method of relief, but who were the least accustomed to deprivation and hardship. They shrank from an exposure of their poverty, though it was no fault of their own, and, though sufferers in common with tens of thousands of others, from a great public calamity, they would perish rather than appear as the recipients of public bounty. If they were to be helped at all, they must be helped in some special way. It was no time to stop and consider whether the feeling was altogether reasonable or not. It was painfully evident that a want existed, growing out of previous conditions in life of the sufferers, and public opinion as well as private feeling made it necessary to devise some way to meet it. It was believed that the personal and confidential relations between pastor and people, 
and between the officers and members of benevolent and fraternal societies, would reveal a great many cases of this sort, and many, it was thought, would ask aid for themselves if encouraged to do so by being permitted to seek relief where publicity could be avoided, and the shock be lessened to their sensitiveness and reserve. Moved by these considerations, the committee invoked the aid in counsel of clergymen and the representatives of the societies just referred to. By the establishment of a bureau to be devoted exclusively to special relief, and to be under the control of a committee appointed by this body of our fellow citizens, it was proposed to bring into line all effort on behalf of the unfortunate, that none should be left to perish for want of sympathy and help. Most of those whose aid was invoked entered heartily into the work, and with a sincere desire to lighten the general labors of the society. Perhaps it was too much to expect, even in a cause involving only the single purpose of feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, that the plan should succeed in satisfying all those who sought to make use of the means in the hands of the society. It is by no means easy to say always where the obligations of those entrusted with the delicate task of deciding between the claims of different classes begin or where they end. And the most careful judgment, and the most even justice, will not save their decisions from sometimes seeming invidious. But nevertheless, since the special bureau, E. C. Learned Chairman, was opened at the Church of the Messiah, its usefulness has become daily more and more manifest, and more and more appreciated. Mr. Larned has been assisted by Rev. Laird Collier, B. G. Caulfield, Rev. E. P. Goodwin, Lewis Wall, G. R. Chittenden, Orrington Lunt, Mrs. Joseph Medill, Mrs. David A. Gage, and Mrs. J. E. Tyler, all of whom give their time without compensation. Up to the twenty-fifth instant, aid has been given to one thousand five hundred and twenty-five families. Very few, if any, of these had previously sought for relief through the ordinary channels, and would, no doubt, some from pride, and some from inability through sickness or infirmity, have suffered the very extremity of distress before they would or could have looked for succor in that direction. While great care is taken that there shall be from its stores no duplication of supplies from other distributing points, all applications are received and considered with all the delicacy and reserve that the nature of the business admits of, and there can be no doubt that it has relieved the wants of thousands who would otherwise have been left uncared for, or dependent upon the chance charity of those who should happen to know of their condition. One of its methods of relief, especially, has saved many worthy women from penury and despair, by putting into their hands the means of immediate and comfortable subsistence. Arrangements have been made with all the principal manufacturers of sewing machines, by which they generously agreed to accept a large discount on the usual price of a single machine. A payment of twenty dollars is made as the first installment on that price and one hundred and thirty-two machines have thus been purchased, and given to that number of deserving women, who brought satisfactory evidence that they had been sufferers by the fire. So many are reinstated, and many more will be in the same way, in their former means of earning a livelihood. CHARITABLE INSTITUTIONS The support which has hitherto been given to the permanent charitable institutions of the city, has been swallowed up in the greater calamity which has thrown nearly a third of our people upon the charity of the world. But while their ordinary resources are thus taken away, the necessity for help for the particular classes under their care is greater than ever. The Relief Society feel that they would have failed in a complete discharge of the duties imposed upon them by the trust put into their hands, if they failed to recognize the claims of these special charities. The Committee on Charitable Institutions, N. S. Boughton, Chairman, have extended aid, therefore, to the following institutions. The Home for the Friendless, the Protestant Orphan Home, the St. Joseph Asylum for Orphans, the Old Ladies' Home, the House of the Good Shepherd, the Foundlings' Home, the Half-Orphans' Home. 
to all of these institutions a monthly allowance in money is given and those which have been burned out have been supplied in addition with food clothing bedding and stores sufficient for their immediate necessities still further aid will be extended to them all if it shall be found requisite to carry them through the winter there were other institutions of a similar character which were destroyed and their inmates dispersed these have not yet provided themselves with permanent residences and the committee do not feel justified by the means at their disposal to advance the large sums that would be required for their re-establishment they can only undertake to supplement in some measure to those whose responsibilities are still existent the resources of which they are deprived by the general disaster the sailors home only was made an exception to this rule though that institution lost its house by the fire the inmates were kept together and the shelter committee has offered to put up a temporary building for them at a cost not to exceed five thousand dollars end of section thirteen section fourteen of the great chicago fire by various authors report of the chicago relief and aid society part five this librivox recording is in the public domain purchasing and transportation the necessity of purchasing material in food and clothing was imperative even at the outset notwithstanding the large contributions of both that were made from abroad but large as they were they were not sufficient even when most bountiful to supply the demands made upon the committee and only enabled them to bridge over the interval until supply and demand could be made to balance each other by an organized system a purchasing committee j mcgregor adams chairman was therefore appointed with experienced and responsible merchants to aid him who anticipating the wants at the several distributing points hold themselves in readiness at all times as far as possible to meet the requisitions of the general superintendent their operations extend to all parts of this country and of england for to replace even partially only the complete destruction of so much household stuff the accumulation of years and to feed so large a multitude suddenly deprived of their ordinary means of livelihood is an immense and most difficult work the supply of many manufactured articles in the markets immediately accessible to the committee intended to meet the ordinary demand has not been found to be at all commensurate to this sudden necessity to duplicate past supplies which had gone into the hands of the consumers chicago has wanted for the past six weeks more stoves of a certain pattern more blankets more mattresses more boots and shoes more furniture of various kinds than were within its reach to meet the emergency the problem has been to find and to purchase all these wherever they were to contract for the manufacture of more as speedily as possible and to get them into the hands of those in want this onerous duty has devolved upon the purchasing committee and it has required their utmost activity assisted by a large clerical force and a most thorough organization to keep pace with the constant and pressing demands of an impoverished people the weekly payroll given above shows the heavy expenditures for transportation which must be constantly incurred this also is under the direction of a special committee of which colonel charles g hammond was appointed chairman for several weeks their labors were much increased by the perplexing duty of providing passes for the large number of persons who wished to leave chicago and were without the means of doing so it was absolutely necessary though by no means easy to discriminate among the multitude who asked for passes as there was danger of giving to undeserving persons and imposing upon the generosity and good nature of the railroad companies who had thrown open their roads as a part of the general relief the number of free passes given was six thousand and thirty five recommendations which were usually accepted by the roads for two hundred and ninety seven were granted and half fare was paid on eighty two tickets it is only now in exceptional cases that applications of this sort receive any favorable attention 
and this branch of relief is pretty much closed. A careful record of names of persons and destinations has been kept, and is an interesting voucher of one of the incidents of the great fire. To expedite the business of this committee, and indeed the business generally of the society, telegraphic communication has been established between headquarters and all the warehouses and stations. The convenience has been very great, as the distances between the points of communication are long, and the travel through the burnt portions of the city is much impeded, while the expense is small, as the operators are also employed as clerks. For this facility, as well as for much else, the Society is indebted to the effective aid of General Stager, Superintendent of the Western Union Company. STORING AND RECEIVING GOODS in a preliminary report of this sort, it is not intended to enter upon detailed accounts of stock and accounts current. These more properly belong to an advanced stage of the work, when, after system and order are thoroughly established, there will be leisure to unravel some of the confusion and disorder which at the outset were inevitable. That this should be most marked and most difficult to deal with in the receiving and storing of goods was unavoidable. The principal railroad depots were destroyed by the fire, and the three hundred and thirty carloads of goods of all kinds, which from the eleventh to the sixteenth of October were so lavishly poured in from all parts of the country, and which, coming free of freight charges, were without waybills or invoices, had necessarily to be unloaded from side tracks at remote points of the town, the packages instantly opened and their contents disposed of, or sent without record or count wherever they were most needed. It was a question then only of feeding the starving and clothing the naked, and not of regularity of business. The law of humanity was paramount to the rules of commerce. General Sheridan had early taken possession of two large warehouses, and these, with full complement of workmen and guards, he presently turned over to a committee, Murray Nelson, chairman, to be assisted by General Hardy. This was the first step out of confusion in this department. About the same time, the skating rink on the west side, two large stores, a smaller one, and the Church of the Messiah, were taken and occupied, partly as storehouses and partly as points of distribution. They were no more than were needed, then, for disorder demands space. But order gradually evolved out of this chaos, as the heterogeneous mass of contributions gave way to regular, though larger, commercial orders. The railroad arrangements were brought back to something of their former facilities, regular and numerous points of distribution were established, and system generally introduced and maintained. In accordance with the principle of concentration adopted in all the departments of the work, the general warehouses are now reduced to two only, the rink and the Church of the Messiah, the latter for its special bureau, while the former is the depot for all the articles except vegetables distributed in the various districts, and which are drawn from it by the special requisition of the superintendents as they are needed. A large frost-proof building has been built for the storage of vegetables, and two large cellars are used for the same purpose. These several warehouses may be said to constitute the wholesale department of the relief work, as the distributing districts are the retail establishments. The aim is to manage all with commercial exactness and economy, and notwithstanding the immense difficulties in the way, a reasonable degree of success has already been achieved. Employment Bureau There has been no lack of employment, particularly of unskilled labor, since the fire, but as that could not be foreseen, it was thought prudent to establish an employment bureau in connection with the general work. An employment committee, N. K. Fairbank, chairman, was therefore appointed, with headquarters in a temporary building in the courthouse yard. This has been a sort of labor exchange in the very heart of the burnt district, where those wanting mechanics or laborers could find them, and where those in need of work were provided with it. The superintendents at all the points of distribution 
are instructed to send every able-bodied man or boy who applies to them for aid to the bureau of the employment committee and the ticket he takes becomes a certificate of character if labor is found for him as is almost invariably the case he surrenders the ticket and it is returned to the superintendent who issued it if the ticket is not presented at the employment bureau and not returned therefore to the superintendent it is presumptive evidence that the bearer prefers to eat the bread of idleness rather than work for his own subsistence and if he again presents himself at the distributing station his claim for relief is rejected if having obtained work of which the returned ticket is evidence he asks again for relief the proper inquiry decides whether his labor is not sufficient to sustain himself and his family if he has one or whether he has asked for bounty of which he is not in need this check upon imposition has served its purpose admirably though it is no more than common justice to say that to shirk work and live upon charity by preference is the exception and not the rule among the laboring people of chicago most of the mechanics who apply at the employment bureau for work are in want of tools without which they can do nothing at their trades this want the committee has supplied and by giving the applicant from ten to twenty dollars worth of tools he is at once made self-supporting and ceases to be dependent upon the relief society a large number of carpenters have thus been effectively and permanently helped as the demand for their labor is greater than for that of any other class bricklayers gas fitters shoemakers and other mechanics have also been aided in the same way the bureau has not undertaken to find employment for women but has turned that class over to other organizations who have hitherto made its care their special business excepting seamstresses who are received and cared for by the bureau of special relief women seeking employment have been left under the direction of such societies and especially of the ladies christian union which in this part of the work has been a valuable coadjutor of the relief and aid society end of section 14 15 of the great chicago fire by various authors report of the chicago relief and aid society part 6 this librivox recording is in the public domain sick sanitary and hospital measures the committee on sick sanitary and hospital measures is composed of men representing fairly the medical profession of the city dr h a johnson is the chairman provisions for medical relief have been made as follows visitation the city has been divided into districts and sub-districts with the same boundaries and the same offices as those of the superintendents of distribution to each of these divisions a medical superintendent and a sufficient number of visiting physicians have been appointed their duties are defined as follows first each visiting physician will establish an office in connection with the depot of distribution in his district second he will at a specified hour morning and evening visit the office and answer such calls as may be left by the superintendent of distribution the visitors and the medical superintendent of the district third he will supply himself with a case and medicines for the use of those only who are the proper subjects of relief by this society fourth he will affix to each prescription that he may send to the dispensing chemist his signature with a statement that this prescription is on account of the chicago relief and aid society fifth he will especially examine into the sanitary condition of his district the quantity and quality of food clothing dwellings etc and all matters having a bearing upon public or private health sixth he will report daily to the medical superintendent of his district the name age sex and nativity of each patient with the name of the disease result of treatment number of visits to each patient and such other information as the medical superintendent may from time to time require 
Seventh, each medical superintendent will have the immediate direction of the medical service and sanitary interest of his district, and will be held responsible for the faithful performance of this work. He will assign visiting physicians to sub-districts, and require of them daily reports of their work. These reports he will condense and present weekly to the committee. He will admit patients to hospital, and in cases of emergency, visit patients at their homes. The general superintendent has directed visitors to report all cases coming to their knowledge requiring medical attendance, and the person in charge of each office has such reports at all times in readiness for the medical officer of the district when he calls. All possible aid is given the medical officer of the district, and he is allowed free access to the office and books of the society at all times. Medical Dispensaries in addition to this provision for the visitation of the sick at their homes, dispensaries have been established at convenient points, where such patients as are able to apply in person for advice are treated, and where medicines are dispensed upon the prescriptions of any physician certifying that his services in the case are gratuitous. In the North Division of the city, there is now only one of these institutions, another will be opened as soon as the need of it shall be evident. In the West Division there are three, and in the South Division two. Medicines are also dispensed, and outpatients treated at all of the hospitals. The physicians to these dispensaries are men of approved character and professional standing. Hospitals For the relief of such patients as cannot safely be treated in their homes or quarters, and who cannot apply at a dispensary, hospital accommodations have been provided. Fortunately, the principal hospitals of the city were in the unburned district. Arrangements have been made with all these institutions by which patients are received on account of this society, without charge for medical and surgical attendance, nursing and general care, the society furnishing only medicines, rations, and furniture for such relief patients as may be received on its account. These hospitals are as follows. The Providence Hospital, located just beyond the northern limits of the city. The Women's and Children's Hospital, formerly located on North State Street, but now temporarily at number 598 West Adams Street. This is mainly a lying-in hospital. The Chicago Eye and Ear Infirmary, under the care of Dr. E. L. Holmes before the fire on Pearson Street in the North Division, now at 579 West Adams Street. St. Luke's Hospital on Indiana Avenue between 14th and 16th Streets. The Scammon Hospital on Cottage Grove Avenue near 29th Street. The Mercy Hospital, corner of Calumet Avenue and 26th Street and the County Hospital, Arnold Street, near 18th Street. In addition to these accommodations, the committee are building a hospital in the Burnt District of the North Division. The plan is essentially that of the United States Army hospitals. Hospitals are also being constructed in connection with the barracks in the West and North Divisions of the city. Patients are admitted to hospitals upon the order of the medical officers of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, the sanitary superintendent of the Board of Health, and the county physician. Supplies to hospitals and dispensaries are issued upon requisitions endorsed by the chief medical officer of the institution, and approved by the chairman of the Committee on Sick, Sanitary, and Hospital Measures. The dispensaries and hospitals report daily to the chairman of this committee the number of patients treated, number of deaths, number of recoveries, and, as often as required, the names of relief patients under treatment. With the daily reports from the visiting physicians and these reports from hospitals and dispensaries, the committee will be able to give at any time the name and address of every patient treated and, at the close of their work, the result of the case. Burials Arrangements have been made with the county authorities, by which, at a small cost to the relief fund, all who may die while under the care of this department will be furnished a coffin and hearse, 
to any of the cemeteries in the vicinity of the city. Orders for such burial are given by Dr. Jonathan H. Ranch of the Board of Health, Dr. B. C. Miller, County Physician, or Dr. H. A. Johnson. How to Obtain Medical Relief To obtain medical relief, it is only necessary to make application to some one of the superintendents of distribution, to a visitor of that bureau, or to a medical superintendent. The offices and office hours of the physicians of the society will be found in the directory at the end of this report. Sanitary Regulations and Condition The sanitary questions connected with houses and barracks have been carefully considered, and the suggestions of this committee have been adopted by the Committee on Shelter. The barracks are subject to a careful daily inspection by sanitary officers, and regulations best calculated to maintain health are rigidly enforced. The statistics thus far indicate that these quarters are probably more healthy than those occupied by the same class of tenants before the fire. Up to the present time, November 30th, only one death has occurred among a population of 5,000 in barracks. For the last four years, our city has experienced a singular immunity from smallpox. We can hope to maintain this only by the same measures hitherto used, namely vaccination and revaccination. This has been made compulsory in the barracks, and all of our citizens have been urgently advised to submit themselves to the same operation. The returns from hospitals, dispensaries, and visiting physicians show that, to the date of this report, about 5,000 patients have been cared for by the medical officers of this society. A circular has been prepared and issued, earnestly inviting the cooperation of our citizens in providing for the sick proper nourishment, delicacies, and such care as cannot be given by the physician. It is believed that material aid will thus be secured for the committee in the administration of medical relief. This department is indebted for valuable assistance to the Board of Health, and especially to the sanitary superintendent, who has given his personal attention to the sanitary arrangements and police of the houses and barracks. The medical force is made up of men prominent in the profession, and earnest and conscientious in the discharge of their duties, and with the above provisions it is believed that help will be brought within the reach of all, and none will suffer for anything that humanity, guided by educated art, can do for them. End of section 15. Sixteen of the Great Chicago Fire by various authors. Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part Seven. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nationalities. The world came to the help of Chicago in her great calamity, for humanity's sake and with no selfish purpose. And yet, all those who were helping us were stretching out their full hands to their own people. The sufferers by the fire were of all nationalities, and of the 18,478 families who have needed succor, 1,965 only were of native birth. Of the other 16,513, the larger proportion, perhaps, were naturalized citizens, but they were made up of all the civilized nations of the earth. Those returned as Africans are, of course, all Americans by birth, and we have, therefore, according to the following table, twenty distinct nationalities represented among those whose great desolation appealed so strongly to the sympathies of all peoples. The noble response would have, we are sure, been no more prompt and no more bountiful had the whole world known that it was brothers of their own blood who had thus been stricken with sudden calamity that they made haste to help. But it is none the less interesting to know that a generous impulse has thus anticipated what might have seemed a national obligation. The following table is an accurate return from the books kept at all the distributing stations. 
Nationality. Number of families. American, 1,724. English, 599. Scotch, 195. Irish, 5,512. German, 7,280. French, 185. Italian, 112. Canadians, 94. Swiss, 30. Danish, 14. Spanish, 2. Polish, 90. Russian, 2. Jewish, 43. Hungarian, 4. Bohemian, 208. Welsh, 10. Belgian, 23. Holland, 5. Greek, 1. Scandinavian, 2,104. African, 241. Total, 18,478 families. Future Wants We have many inquiries from all quarters as to the future. In view of the great generosity with which our people have been treated, we have felt that further demands ought not to be pressed upon public attention until we were in possession of some definite knowledge which would enable us to approximate their extent for the winter, and we herewith furnish definite figures, so far as possible, together with estimates based upon our experience in the work. Future wants depend largely upon the weather, as outdoor labor can be prosecuted in a mild winter, which must stop in a season of great severity. Now at the beginning of winter we have no reasonable ground for expecting the demand to decrease or even stand still. It will be observed from the foregoing tables that for the week ending November 18th the number of families receiving assistance increased from 12,765 to 14,137, and that for the week ending November 25th there was a further increase from 14,137 to 15,122 families, an alarming percentage of addition. In our estimates, we have taken the present number as a basis, and the period of six months from October 9th as the time to be covered for the present winter. It is very certain that there will be an increase of the present number of families during a portion of the winter, but we expect this to be counterbalanced by a falling off toward spring. Estimate of Expenditures of Chicago Relief and Aid Society for six months, from October 9, 1871 to April 9, 1872. Food and Fuel Rations for 15,122 families of five persons each at three dollars ten and a half cents per week. Forty six thousand nine hundred and fifty three dollars and eighty one cents. Shelter Committee eight thousand furnished houses at one hundred and twenty five dollars each one million dollars. Barracks and furniture for two thousand families at eighty dollars each one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Hospital and storehouses, $83,000. Stoves, in addition to those used in new houses and barracks, $75,000. Special Bureau, $250,000. Charitable institutions, $25,000. Deducting contributions of clothing and mattresses and furniture furnished by the Shelter Committee, already charged, it is estimated that 10,081 of the 15,122 families must be supplied with clothing, shoes, furniture, beds, and bedding, at a cost of $866,966. Current expenses, at $9,758.98 a week, for 26 weeks, 
$253,733.48. General Expenses, Shelter Committee, $42,000. Total Expenditures, $3,976,498.54. Total of Contributions, $3,418,188.20. Deficit, $558,310.34. It is expected that the current expenses can be materially diminished, but if continued at the present rate, they would come to a little over 7% on the gross amount to be expended, the expense of conducting a business which is so largely of a retail character, including visitors as well as distributors, is reduced from the fact that the heads of the various departments are paid no compensation. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 8. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. General Remarks Neither this society nor any other human agency can meet all the suffering in Chicago this winter. Under ordinary circumstances, some cases of want must have undoubtedly escaped the observation of the relief officers and others perhaps have been refused aid who were really worthy. To some extent this must always occur. But in determining the efficiency of this society, a fair statement of the case is expressed in this question. Is it the best agency we can avail ourselves of, both for activity and honesty, and will the Relief Society make this money go farther than can be done in any other way at our command? If the fund at our disposal were sufficient to buy all needed things, it is simply impossible to purchase in so short a time any considerable portion of the necessary articles that were to be found in the homes of a hundred thousand people. Take as an illustration the article of stoves. No stoves were saved from the fire. To replace them, a medium-sized soft coal cook stove was needed. No other would answer. To some extent, wood stoves were sent, but we had no wood. Under the active direction of A. B. Meeker, the Society has managed to buy, between the Atlantic and the Missouri River, 8,500 stoves of the kind demanded, and here and elsewhere has obtained pipe and furniture for them. But with the stoves purchased, our difficulties were by no means surmounted. We have been subjected to delays in railway transportation and movement of goods about the city in common with our merchants, many of whom had merchandise lying three weeks within a few miles of Chicago, which could neither be received nor stored. Every possible facility and courtesy has been extended to this society by railway and express companies connecting with Chicago, and also by the Western Union Telegraph Company, and the Atlantic Cable Company, in transmitting free our answers to dispatches and orders for goods. Yet, with all these advantages, we have been able to actually deliver, up to November 25th, but 6,600 stoves. There is precisely the same difficulty in the delivery of mattresses, blankets, and many articles furnished by the Society, which have been drawn from Buffalo, Detroit, Montreal, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Louisville, Cincinnati, and other points. With this delay in the arrival of goods, the best we could do was to give applicants orders to be filled in turn, informing them at the same time of the situation. Some of these orders, we regret to say, were many times presented at our depots without being filled, but this was not the result of any defect in our system but simply because a supply of the article asked for was not to be had. Nor was there any delay in contracting for these things. 
within three days from the time the society assumed the work of relief large engagements were made both in the united states and canada for supplies which it was plain would be needed we refer to these facts in order that applicants as well as the public at large may form some idea if possible of the difficulties surrounding the transaction of all business in chicago during the last few weeks yet we may be allowed to call attention to the fact that we have just passed through two weeks of unusually severe winter weather accompanied by snow but that the needy are provided for and the sick and infirm attended to it is not the purpose of the present report to give a detailed account of all purchases and disbursements the business is so conducted that at the conclusion of the work we shall render a final account with satisfactory vouchers for every dollar expended the books of the respective departments of our paymaster cashier purchasing bureau and auditing committee are always open to the public the pressure upon us toward irresponsible and promiscuous disbursement is so strong and in many cases from such respectable quarters that we feel compelled to ask the thoughtful attention of our people to the immense danger and possible disgrace that may result from encouraging any mode of disposition that disregards accurate systematic accounting as the whole world has made us gifts the whole world will wish to know what we have done with them it is the duty of this society to be instructed by events if the committee were convinced from what they know of this work that any of the guards thrown around the present modes of disbursement could be safely removed they would cheerfully remove them but it has been our experience thus far that persons who bring well-considered honest cases make the least complaint of red tape while as a rule those who complain most of investigation come with cases that most require it what darker disgrace could overtake our beloved city than the waste and spoliation of this fund the fire was a calamity this would be a crime to permit it is to become guilty of a twofold offence first against our benefactors and our own city second against humanity an offence that might and probably would prevent any american city from hereafter receiving assistance in a similar emergency it were almost better for those of us who are left to have perished in the flames on that memorable night than that so indelible a stain should be fixed upon our hitherto fair name it is one thing to do this work well and quite another to have everybody pleased almost all other things in this world have been done one or more times but surely the disbursement of over three millions of dollars among seventy-five thousand persons so as to give universal satisfaction is a problem upon which experience throws but little light the most difficult part of our management is to secure courteous visitors and employees at distributing points it is employment not sought and of a very uninviting nature in this portion of the work the people can help us greatly by the following card published in our daily papers we have indicated a way in which it can be done special notice the work of the relief society is enormous extending over many miles of territory and in all its departments embracing more than seventy five thousand people conducted largely by persons whose conduct we cannot personally scrutinize it is the people's work we are trying to do and we ask all persons to give us information in writing of any abuses either in distribution or deportment committed by any officer or person connected with this society we particularly invite information as to cases where people receive aid who ought not to have it as well as cases where needy and worthy persons were overlooked such communications should be precise giving names places definite particulars and be addressed to o c gibbs superintendent chicago relief and aid society standard hall in one respect perhaps our citizens are not patient and thoughtful enough cases of want coming to their knowledge 
are too often turned over to us without the slightest examination, as if the whole duty of the person applied to were discharged by sending the applicant to the relief depots, whereas, in fact, a very few are trying to do a work that belongs to the public, and equally with ourselves in some degree to every member of that public. It is true we have accepted certain official positions that involve the organization of a plan through which the sufferers can be reached, and also attention to particular duties that require constant presence. In this there is nothing exclusive, for these things must always be done by a few. But in a work of this character and of such general concern, by far the most important part of the effort is not to be had for money and as soon as the machinery is in order, the duty of the public attaches, one branch of which is to interest themselves enough in cases that reach them, or that may be found by proper exertion, to ascertain the facts, and the proper places to which to send the needy, when relief would follow as an easy matter. In this way much suffering will be found that may escape the observation of our visitors, and at the same time the people would become familiar with our system, and be able to make us valuable suggestions, bring abuses to our knowledge, and aid in their speedy correction. It is not our purpose to enter upon a defense of the society or our own efforts. In the presence of such calamities, all questions of a personal nature are frivolous. We wish, as much as any one can, that our powers were commensurate with our desire to accomplish this task, and have said what we have solely with a view to point out some ways in which we hope the work may be advanced. The time has not come to a people so worn and disordered as our own for appropriate acknowledgment of the wonderful gifts that have reached our city from all parts of the world. They were made to the people of Chicago and the people, in their own way and time, will prefer to perform this act of gratitude. But we may be permitted, as more immediate observers, to say that it is hardly probable that the immense necessity and usefulness of this aid will be ever thoroughly known. With it the terrors of a long winter, to hungry, unsheltered thousands, have given way to a reasonable degree of confidence and hope. The spectacle of all nations rushing to lift us from our deep desolation has made an impression upon our hearts, which will long survive the rebuilding of our city. Our people are commanded by the confidence and the sympathy of all mankind to prove themselves equal to this emergency, and in a most tender manner are instructed anew that he who, for a purpose wiser than we can know, permitted this affliction, hath made of one blood all nations of men. Note. The next twenty-five pages of this pamphlet will not be read here. They consist of a series of financial tables detailing the receipts and expenditures of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society from October 14, 1871 until November 18, 1871. End note. End of Section 17 End of the Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society End of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Recording by Maria Casper